And I'm Bill Riley, the Director of the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research at the NIH. And I want to welcome all of you to the 11th NIH Matilda White Riley Behavioral and Social Science Honors. Um, for the past 11 years, it's been OBSSR's pleasure to honor the exceptional accomplishments in health-related behavioral and social sciences research. Our listing of past Matilda White Riley recipients reads like a who's who of behavioral and social scientists, uh, beginning with David Mechanic, who was our first distinguished lecturer, to this year's uh, distinguished lecturer, Dr. Terry Moffitt. Um, they're exemplars of careers dedicated to leveraging behavioral and social sciences to improve health. This will be the third year in which we've also expanded the event to recognize emerging scientists via a competition of recently published papers by early stage investigators. So we look forward to those presentations as well this year. As many of you know, this event honors Matilda White Riley. Um, after a distinguished teaching um, and research career at Rutgers and Bowdoin College, studying a range of topics, including the sociology of aging. She joined the newly formed Institute of Aging in 1979 at the um, lovely age of 68, um, when most of us are probably thinking about retiring. Uh, she joined the NIH at that time and established and led what is now the Division of Behavioral and Social Research at NIA. Her leadership and influence extended beyond NIA and the NIH. She co-chaired the joint Adam Ha, the NIH Steering Committee for the Institute of Medicine's Project on Health and Behavior, and then the subsequent Trans-NIH Working Group on Health and Behavior in the 1980s. In her various roles, she often served as a senior NIH spokesperson of the behavioral and social sciences, encouraged coordination among the NIH institutes, oversaw production of numerous reports to Congress on behavioral research at the NIH, and provided advice to several of the NIH directors. Essentially, Matilda White Riley, who is no um, relationship to me, <laughs> was the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research before the Office of Social Behavioral and Social Science Research was formed in 1995. And it's our honor each year to remember her contribution to the formation of OBSSR and the importance of social and behavioral sciences here at the NIH. So before I turn the podium over to Dr. Bill Elwood, a reminder that this event is being video recorded and photographed. There's certainly worse venues in which your likeness could be associated with, um, but just a reminder that we want everyone to be aware about that. Um, so let me now introduce Dr. Bill Elwood, who's led the um, early stage investigator paper competition for each of the last three years. So Bill, it's all yours. Our annual honors are named uh, uh, in the behavioral and social sciences for the entire agency are named for Matilda White Riley because she championed the behavioral and social sciences across the entire agency, though she was based at NIA. Um, over the course of her career, she also championed social and behavioral researchers to continuously improve and advance their own science with the goal of improving health and well-being over their entire life course. Um, and that's why in 2007, uh, our office named the excellence, original excellence lecturer for her, and, uh, um, and then three years ago began the early stage investigator competition. Um, you might wonder why. And uh, um, you know NIH has a goal uh, um, and different processes to foster early stage investigators and new PIs who can be of any age so long as they've never received an R01. Uh, um, one thing you may not know is that Matilda herself was an early stage investigator. Uh, um, she, at age 20, she, uh, 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 she was not interested in sociology and gerontology at the beginning. She was interested in mechanics. And so at age 20, she published her first book called Gliding and Soaring, an Introduction to Motorless Flight. Uh, um, and then she, uh, for college, she went to Radcliffe. Because back in those days, uh, um, women couldn't get into Harvard. It was for men only. So Matilda went to Radcliffe, but she was a research assistant in labs at Harvard. Uh, she established uh, uh, the market research company of America, akin to the Nielsen Agency, in addition to the faculty appointments she held that Bill Riley told you about. Uh, um, and when she left here in her... Uh, late 70s, she went back to Bowdoin College and continued to teach and mentor there until her death. Uh, um, 
Matilda's science, Dr. White Riley's science, also evolved over her entire life course. As I told you, she went from motorless flight to sociology. Uh, um, she and her uh, husband and research partner, Jack Riley, uh, promoted some communication theories, which are taught to this day. Uh, um, people continue to cite her seminal work in gerontology. Uh, um, and she developed the idea of age integration to facilitate intergenerational interactions to promote health and well-being among people of all ages. Uh, um, because she is the one who is famous, at least at NIH, for saying people don't grow up in old in laboratories. They grow up in old in changing societies. Uh, um, Bill told you that uh, uh, she worked on reports from the Institute of Medicine. It won't surprise you that she also was uh, appointed to the National Academy of Sciences. So uh, this event is named for her because she is someone who infused behavioral and social sciences across the NIH. She encouraged existing researchers to ask new questions and seek new methods and approaches to solve longstanding questions and to create uh, um, research opportunities for emerging stage investigators. How did we define uh, ESIs for the state of this competition? They are people within 10 years of their terminal degree and or other training. And they could submit one article uh, for which they were the lead author or otherwise uh, um, had a leadership role in that paper that was accepted or published between January and f 1st and December 31st, 2017. We received 334 articles that met those criteria. Some did not meet those criteria, and we turned away, uh, turned those away. The selection committee, many of who are in this room, uh, ranked the articles by how well they advanced behavioral and social sciences, science excellence within the NIH mission to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. The committee also considered how each paper reflected one or more aspects of Dr. White Riley's vision of research excellence, which was at threefold. To advance a conceptualization of health and well-being beyond the lack of an illness or a sole clinical outcome. So, uh, for example, an optimal well-being with a clinic condition. Two, uh, to illuminate the complex and dynamic interplay among social, behavioral, and or neurological processes at multiple levels. And to build theory or methods within the NIH mission to advance health and longevity to reduce illness and disability. Uh, um, so the four people you will hear from shortly truly embody international excellence in behavioral and social health research. And now it is my privilege to present the certificate. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be th here. Thank you, Dr. Elwood, for uh, giving us the opportunity to participate in this competition. I'm, uh, I feel so honored to, to be a recipient of this award. So I just wanted to start my talk uh, acknowledging the funding that I got to uh, write the paper. Um, so uh, uh, when I was working on this, I was part of a T32 training uh, that was funded by the um, Department of Health and Human Services. And I also uh, participated in a training um, through our uh, institutional CTSI awarded at the, uh, by the NIH. So uh, part of what I did was also sponsored by the NIH. So uh, also thank you. And I gotta say this disclosure that you are well aware of that you know, like all of the ideas that I'm gonna be sharing with you are not your responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, to get started, uh, researchers almost all the time, we wanna 
we try to identify what are the causal mechanisms uh, or what are the causes uh, uh, of, you know, like, uh, uh, phenomenon that, that we're studying, that we're investigating. And, uh, and we want to try to assess whether those associations are, are causal. That's, that's, at the end of the day, that's, that, that's what we oftentimes want to study. And it's well known that, that randomized clinical trials are, are the gold standard for doing that. The problem is that uh, randomized trials are expensive. Sometimes they are prohibitive to conduct ethically, economically. There, there are many challenges for, for doing RCTs. Uh, and, and that's the reason why. So before coming here, I um, did a little uh, search in PubMed where I typed the keyword cert, uh, study. And I got you know like all, all, all the hits uh, in Yeah, it's not. This one? All right. So I got all the studies. And then I added the word randomized to get all, like, all the randomized studies. And I found those, those ones in red. So there's a great gap between the randomized trials and all the knowledge that, that we are producing as, as researchers and that, uh, that you know, like people are reading. Uh, so, so that, that, that's a huge gap, and, and that's where the idea of, well, some of this research is uh, conducted at labs and it's experimental, but others, other research is uh, conducted with observational data, which is the, the source of data where most of the research comes from. Uh, and then, you know, like the whole idea was, well, how we could better use that observational data how we can squeeze it to improve the, the, the causal inference from, uh, from it. That, that's the whole purpose of, of the study. So, uh, so it's good to, to, uh, to better understand the, the idea of why the RCTs are the gold standard is because they are based on the counterfactual model uh, to understand causal effects. And what this model uh, proposes is that in, in, in a hypothetical world, the only way of saying where, whether an exposure to a certain factor produces an effect is, in ideally, is in the same person, in the same time, with and without the exposure. But, but that's, that's just impossible, right? You know, like, so uh, uh, whether you know, like exposure to something produces growth, right? It would be ideal to have the same person at the same time receiving and not receiving the, you know, like the treatment. Um, so we do randomized trials where we, you know, like uh, get groups of people that are different from each other, and you know, we expose some of them and, and others, and we follow them up and see whether, you know, like the group that's exposed, uh, uh, there's some change over there. And, uh, and the key to this is, is the random assignment because they have equal probabilities of being exposed and, and, and not exposed. And, and that's what, uh, what creates that these groups are comparable or exchangeable between groups. So, so this could be either here or here. So based on that assumption of the randomized trials, uh, we, we could then at the end of the day say, well, the effect that we observed after follow-up was due to the exposure. So, so there, are, there are many ways of... Um, of addressing the, um, the, uh, the problem of, of confounding. And you know, like one was uh, 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 at the study design level where randomization takes care of that. Whoa. Uh, however, other tools uh, are, um, oh, whoa. So this restriction, right? Like if we know that there's a certain confounder, you know, like we can restrict the sample that we are recruiting uh, so we, we don't have that confounding effect. We can, uh, uh, I'll let you guys uh, take this. <laughs> uh, uh, this is some? Okay, so, 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 so we can restrict the sample to only focus in the people that uh, we're interested. So we eliminate the confounding factor of that uh, variable because we're only including those people at 
that, uh, with that condition. That could be gender, so we're only including males or females in, in our sample. So the other uh, way of uh, doing it is by matching, right? So we have exposed and unexposed people uh, that are exactly the same in that confounding variable. And, and, and we could do that at the study design level by matching those participants uh, uh, at that variable. Uh, okay, and so, so that could be done at the study design phase. Uh, but also um, could be done at the data analysis phase. And, um, and the most common type of, uh, of adjustment for confounding is, is using regression. I think that uh, it's a really well-known um, analytical tool. Um, it's easy to interpret. But the problem is, uh, how, what does it mean holding everything else constant? Yeah, is it constant on the mean? Is it constant at the participants? Uh, uh, um, uh, level of that variable. Um, there are problems with the specification of the regression models. You know, like you need to have, you know, like uh, good predictors or, you know, like include all the confounders. So, so it's, even though it's really well known, there are some assumptions that are oftentimes not, not met in all the studies. So an, another way of doing it is by stratifying. So if we know that age is an important confounder, well, we could run you know, like different regressions according to different strata by age. Uh, uh, and then you know, like by doing that, we eliminate the confounding because we, we're doing that at the different age groups that we think that are having a, a, an effect on the, on the outcome of interest. Um, uh, you could do the restriction and the matching uh, afterwards. And the problem with that is that that reduces the sample of the study that, uh, that you collected. And there are three uh, less used methods that are, that, that are stronger at bringing in uh, the causal inference that are based on the idea of, of mimicking a randomized trial with the observational data. Uh, so the first one is the propensity score matching. A show of hands, how many of you are familiar with, with P-scores? Okay, so many of you. So, so what this method does is you first, it, it's a two-step two process that uh, uh, um, allows researchers to estimate the probability of being um, uh, exposed. So just in a randomized trial, you, the researcher controls the probability of randomization. It could be 50% if there are two groups or you know, like a, a different probability uh, depending on the number of arms in a trial. So, so again, you estimate the probability of receiving either the exposure or, uh, uh, or not uh, of a certain treatment. And then with that probability, you match participants in a sample. And by doing that, you eliminate the, the confounding of, uh, of the covariates because it's matched on the probability of receiving certain treatment. So, so that's a better way of doing it because by eliminating the confoundings of the measured and unmeasured variables, that sort of mimics uh, the randomized trial, the, the purpose of randomization at the study design phase. Standardization, it's, it's another uh, way of, of doing it. Um, it looks, it aims at comparing the, the distribution of the variables in the observed sample with a reference sample. That could be a national reference sample. It could be a, a sample in the county, in the state, in the city, depending on, on, on what type of context you're uh, doing the research. Um, and what, what, so, so it, it's more computational elaborate. Uh, it requires more time. It requires that uh, the variables are measured both within the reference sample and in the actual study sample. So sometimes it's, it's harder to, to do this uh, procedure. And the other uh, tool is the inverse probability weighting. And what this does is uh, estimates the probability of receiving or not the treatment and then weights the, uh, the effects of the exposure on the outcome. Uh, on the inverse of that probability. So it gives a higher weight to those participants who were less likely to be exposed and a lower weight of those participants who had a higher uh, chance of being uh, recipient of a, a certain treatment or not. Uh, so, so the problem is that not all methods uh, enable researchers to claim causal uh, 
causal inferences. They, they, they don't. So, so the, the, the three last ones are, because they are mimicking more uh, of uh, a randomized trial, uh, enable researchers to have better inferences. So what we did in this study were, was to exemplify the use of all these methods um, uh, um, in a certain sample. So what we looked at the question was, is family function uh, related to HDHD, uh, children's HDHD in, in families? So what we use is a, a cross-sectional data set. Um, in a primary care clinic in Santiago, uh, we, uh, when families enrolled in the clinic, we invited them to answer a, a survey that included a, a family functioning scale and an evaluation whether their children had HDHD symptoms. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of how we measure those variables, but. Uh, what we ended up doing is stratifying um, the, the family functioning scores into two groups. The lower group that had a mean score of 76 and the higher group, you know, we did uh, a median split uh, that had an average score of 100. Uh, kind of like mimicking an intervention where folks from um, a control group uh, would receive an intervention that would boost their uh, family relations and therefore increase their family functioning style to a hundreds points. Makes sense? So kind of like thinking that, you know, like there's a control group that didn't get an intervention that had an average score of 76 and then a, a, an intervention group that had a score of 100. So with that, the sample was about uh, 6,000 families that you know, like the lower family functioning uh, style score group, you know, like was kind of like sort of the control, and then the higher group was kind of like the intervention group. And we see that you know, like this is what happens in some studies before adjustment. That there are many covariates that are different between groups. So, for example, at the household, you know, like families were different in their income, they were different in their uh, mental health. And, and many other variables. So it's challenging to, to evaluate just the direct relationship. That's why you know, like randomized trials are, are the gold standard because they enable to uh, adjusting for all these variables and, and not being measured. So what we did is, you know, like, so first we ran you know, like, uh, an unadjusted regression, observing that uh, families with, in the, uh, exposed to the intervention group had lower uh, HDHD, children ch had lower rates of HD, had fewer children with HDHD symptoms. And, and if you see across the board, so then this is, you know, like these are all the other methods. The effects are kind of like the same, right? All the methods give kind of like the same results in terms of the um, effect estimate. So, so the key message, the key message of, of this paper is that uh, using um, more um, nuanced uh, methodological techniques will not change the effect estimates necessarily, necessarily. However, it would change the causal implications, the, the, the interpretation of the data. So with uh, with the findings using propensity score matching or inverse probability weighting, the inference is, is way better. So we can assess um, uh, that there's, we can claim that there could be a causal relationship between family functioning and um, HDHD in the family. So, so the conclusion, you know, like we could, we could strengthen the, the inference uh, of, of our research. And there's a lot of observational research that's conducted using, you know, like national samples uh, um, that, you know, like we could, we could think about how to mimic the gold standard, the randomized trial using um, observational data. So, so what, are, what, what I'm focused particularly in, I, I'm not a statistician, I'm, I'm an applied uh, researcher. And um, I, I focus in personalized prevention strategies. I, I do mixed methods studies, and I really uh, love randomized trials, not knowing their, their limitation. Uh, my, my particular area of interest is the promotion of uh, positive family relationships and, and well-being 
focusing in, in Latino families uh, as a way to uh, eliminate or at least reduce health disparities in, in that community. And um, I focus, since uh, I'm interested in families as a unit of health, um, uh, I'm really interested in a broad array of uh, health outcomes, but particularly mental health and substance use, where uh, most of my research is centered in tobacco and substance use prevention. So I want to thank um, Michael Oakes, who uh, was my mentor. I learned a lot of my methodology uh, from him, and we, we wrote this paper together. Uh, and I'm uh, certain uh, that I would love to take questions and, uh, and have further discussion. I know that this, we had a very brief time to talk, but uh, I would love to keep conversations open uh, for later during the day. Thank you. And now it's time for Dr. Ruth Morin. Ruth? Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ruth Morin, and I am currently a postdoctoral fellow through the MIREC program at San Francisco VA. I am a clinical psychologist by training. So I want to talk this morning about a paper that was published this past year in health psychology called Do Multiple Health Events Reduce Resilience When Compared with Single Events? Okay, so there's a plethora of research to show that depression is comorbid with physical illness. There have been a lot of studies to show both that depression is a possible consequence of the development of a serious physical illness, as well as showing that depression could predate the onset of a physical illness. And there have been some mechanisms postulated for why that might be more on the biomarker inflammatory level. But research over the last decade of so, or so looking at prospective longitudinal data have shown that there are potential subgroups that have different trajectories in their course of symptoms over time. So this research has shown that the depression course in relation to potentially traumatic or serious events such as physical illness is heterogeneous, and that the course of these symptoms over time tends to define subgroups of interest. And in this literature, been in a sort of diverse range of potentially traumatic events such as bereavement, natural disasters, spinal cord injury, divorce, job loss, have shown that the majority of people in these large population-based samples are resilient. And in these studies, they found between 50 and 85 percent of people experiencing these potentially traumatic events show a sort of a resilient response, which is conceptualized as a healthy course of adjustment from the time before the potentially traumatic event to the time afterwards. And the reason this is of interest is because these subgroups may have different risk factors and characteristics with implications for treatment, especially later in life. We would have a sense that as we age, the allostatic load might increase. We have a confluence of developmental, psychosocial, mental health, physical health risk factors that sort of build on one another over the course of the lifespan. They might have different uh, sort of biological mechanisms, such as HPA axis overactivation over time, uh, differences in brain volume that might have implications for well-being, disability, and other adverse outcomes such as mortality. So we'd be really interested in defining these subgroups that are potentially at greater risk for adverse outcomes. If we can define them sort of in advance of those adverse outcomes, that would be ideal. So in this particular study, we use the health and retirement study data set, which is a wonderful resource. Uh, and our goal is to identify depression trajectories following the experience of single or multiple major health events within a discrete period of time. So the health and retirement study samples around every two years. So individuals were sampled that were asked, have you experienced any of these events since the last time we met with you for interview and had never experienced them in the past? That was a 1,395 individuals who experienced either a new onset of heart disease or, my or myocardial infarction, lung disease, cancer, or stroke, one or more of those events. And we wanted to know, will the experience of multiple health events in that time period reduce the proportion of resilience in the sample when compared to individuals who only experienced one event? And also, will the experience of multiple events increase mortality risk over time? We wanted to identify what those depression trajectories might be for those individuals. So I, identifying these trajectories of depression, I used latent growth mixture modeling for single and multiple health events from pre-diagnosis to four years post-diagnosis. 
So one of the benefits of this type of methodology um, is that it is person-centered, so we're able to look at sort of individual patterns of responses over time and potential latent subgroups. So if we imagine there is a normal distribution of older adults in the United States, and we look at them on average, looking if we we're looking at a variable like depression, we might be missing information about these sort of latent subgroups, little sort of smaller normal distributions that might have different shapes and risk factors within that population. So uh, an analysis method like latent growth mixture modeling allows us to identify those subgroups, which might have different characteristics and implications for treatment. So a little bit more about the sample. On average, there were, uh, the age was 74, pretty even gender split. 63.8% of the sample had a high school degree or more education. In terms of income, this is non-housing financial assets. You can see about half the sample is pretty low income. And the sort of most experienced health event was heart disease or MI in the sample. And 73% of participants experienced one major event during that time period and 27% experienced multiple events, and that's conceptualized as sort of a new onset health event. And in terms of the way that the, the data analysis is done, the way that we look at the best fitting model, we identify the different numbers of classes starting with one and sort of going up from there and looking at fit statistics as well as parsimony and theoretical interpretability. So you're looking at a trade-off of these different values to determine the best fitting model. And in this case, we, have, we found four trajectories that best fit the data. So there was a chronic depression trajectory, an emergent depression trajectory, depressed, improved, and resilient. And I'll show those in a little bit more detail. So just to orient you here, on the y-axis we have CESD depression symptoms from low to high, and at four is sort of the conceptualized cutoff for clinical significance of depression symptoms. On the x-axis we have time, and we used a floating baseline methodology, which is to say that if, um, and, and I should say that the waves of HRS that we used were between 1996 and 2012. So if one person gets cancer in 1998 and someone else has a stroke in the year 2000, both of those time points are called onset for those individuals, and then you can look back two years to the interview time point before the onset of the health event, and then four years later to compare individuals over time across a wide variety of data points. So the first trajectory was the chronic depression group. That's 9.3% of the sample. I don't know why we're getting strange boxes under the onset, but we'll just ignore that for a moment. So you can see for these individuals, they're experiencing a high level of depression from the time of the onset of their health event to four years later, but they were also clinically depressed before the onset of those health events. So these individuals seem to be sort of experiencing chronic depression at least over the six years that we're sampling them. But if you were to catch them just as they're being diagnosed, you might think, oh, this is a new onset adjustment-related depression and not realize that this is actually something they've been experiencing for quite some time. The next trajectory is the emergent depression trajectory. That's 12.3% of the sample. And these individuals, you see a little bit more of what you might expect with a major health event, low or no depression two years prior, the development of depressive symptoms following the onset of a health event and persisting in sort of clinical significance over time. We have a depressed improved group that has sort of a clinically, sort of marginally clinically significant depression symptoms prior to the onset of the events, and then a little bit of remitting of those symptoms and remaining relatively low over time. And, and finally, we have the resilient group, which was 64.2% of the sample. It was experiencing little to no depressive symptoms from before the onset of the health event to four years later. Um, and I should just mention uh, briefly that Usually the sampling or of these interviews happens not immediately after a major health event, so we're not, I'm not in, in any way suggesting that it is not distressing or there aren't symptoms immediately following a new diagnosis. Usually they'll catch people in the six month to a year after something like this. So this is the sort of adjustment period in a longer time frame. So these are the four, the four trajectories. And then based on these trajectories, every individual is sort of placed based on their highest probability of membership in one of those classes. And then we can look at predictors of membership in those various groups using the resilient class as a reference. So using the resilient class as a reference, um, the resilient class was more likely to be male, older in age, and have fewer years of education compared to the other samples which we can speculate about maybe in the, in the question and answer session. But actually the number of health events experienced did not 
predict membership in any of these groups. So those with multiple events were not more likely to be in any of, any of the groups compared to another. And a type of health event did not predict membership in any of these groups. So cancer, for example, didn't make people more likely to be chronically depressed. Following this, we wanted to do a known class analysis to see whether these trajectories would remain stable when we were comparing individuals who experienced a single event to those that experienced multiple events. And we found that the, the trajectories were relatively stable here. So you can see that the patterns are pretty similar for single versus multiple events. Uh, one of the most striking findings here is that you can see the multiple events group, 60% of those who experienced multiple events in a short time period were resilient. So that's a pretty striking finding. The only difference in any of the groups, let's see, is this, I'm trying to find, is this the laser pointer? Wow, okay, cool. Um, so in this emergent depression group, there was a significant difference between those who experienced a single event from those who experienced multiple events. And you can see that at, before the onset of the events, their depressive symptoms are similar, but after the onset, those with multiple events became more depressed and remained more depressed over time. Following this, we did a post hoc analysis looking at mortality risk using the National Death Index data six years after the health event and found that the emergent depression group was more likely to have passed away six years later regardless of the number of health events experienced. And that's even more so than the chronic depression group. So that was a specific finding for those with emergent depression regardless of the number of events experienced. So the takeaways here, we found these four classes which are pretty commonly found in this trajectory literature. Chronic depression, emergent depression, depressed, improved, and resilient. We found the same proportion of resilience for those who experienced multiple events compared to single events. Found the emergent depression class to be specifically at risk, both in the sense that those who experienced multiple events became more, de more depressed than their counterparts with a single event. And also that those in emergent depression, regardless of the number of events they experienced, were more likely to have passed away six years later. So I want to mention before I move on a couple of uh, limitations. One of the trade-offs with doing this type of research with these beautiful prospective longitudinal samples is that uh, we don't have specific information about treatment, for example. Um, also, this is probably a biased sample to the extent that you have to have a, a time point after the health event in order to do the analysis, which means inherently these people survive to have the interview and report their depression after the onset of their health event. So it's possible that the individuals who passed away following their health event look different in some way than those that are sampled here. And also, unfortunately, this sample was not diverse enough to look at racial differences between the classes, potentially. Uh, we certainly know that many health disparities exist, and there might be a differential impact of that in terms of trajectories. And unfortunately, we're not able to look at that here. So the sort of takeaway here that as a clinician I'm very excited, excited about is that the majority of individuals appear to be resilient even after these really major life-threatening health events in later life. Uh, it certainly seems to be the case that the combination of depression and health events in later life are a risk factor for adverse outcomes for specific subgroups of individuals. And that clinically, it would be really helpful to target those with emergent symptoms and no prior history. And we'll often ask about depression symptoms following a new diagnosis of a major physical illness, but we don't always look backwards to see what was happening for that person before. This could represent a chronic depression course, or this individual might have some new symptoms that would likely remit naturally over time. And if our resources are limited to offer intervention, it would be helpful to identify who is at greatest risk for poor outcomes over time so we can all allocate those limited resources in the most useful way, especially when we're thinking about planning RCTs. If we have a sense for who's going to remit naturally over time or who's likely to remain chronically depressed, we can target those who might get the most benefit or at least who's greatest at risk for the worst outcome. So really identifying that there are these distinct groups and we don't want to just assume everyone is the same. So my, certainly my long-term goal is to translate findings from these wonderful large data sets into clinical care and back. Uh, I think that there's a lot of room for the multimodal investigation of mental and physical health factors for the rapidly aging population. I'm really excited about the possibility of adding in some social factors in there as well. Um, HRS certainly has a lot of those variables available, but any sort of interaction of larger data sets where you can also do more in-depth interviews with a smaller subset of the sample I think would be really useful. I'm very excited about these uh, analysis techniques, things like LGMM, also other machine learning methods to look at individual uh, level 
statistics to identify subpopulations of interest for intervention. Um, I use the HRS for my dissertation. The HRS has served me very well. And I know there's some really exciting new uh, biological variables and other, um, and other sort of data products coming out of HRS, including a merger with the VA medical record, which is extremely exciting to get to look at sort of those things over time. Okay, and I want to thank my co-authors on this paper, who were Isaac Galtzer Levy, George Bonanno, and Fiona McCallum, the Health and Retirement Study. Uh, my primary mentor currently, Dr. Scott Mackin at the San Francisco VA and UCSF, and the Myrick Fellowship. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth, and thank you all for saving your questions until our panelists all come up at the uh, uh, on the chairs. Now, won't you welcome Justin Parent? Okay, so first, I did not realize how very long this title was <laughs> until this. I noticed it when the NIH was promoting this talk and they put it on Twitter, and I think it just took up the whole, the whole thing. Uh, so good lesson, simpler titles, I think would be better. Today I'm gonna talk about social and behavioral epigenetics and the potential impacts of both social and behavioral environments on both biological embedding of adversity, specifically looking at maltreatment. So what I first want to talk about is epigenetics. And when we talk about epigenetics, it's the study of changes in the organisms resulting from modifications in gene expression rather than specific aspects of the code itself. So what we're talking about is how the environment could actually change the accessibility of genes which I think is really exciting for both social and behavioral researchers. And I'll be focusing on DNA methylation, which is the most commonly studied epigenetic mark. It's thought to be the most stably assessed. However, what I'll be talking about today is actually within a six month time span showing changes in DNA methylation. When we think about DNA methylation, it's really, if I really simplify it, it's about sort of blocking access to a certain gene. So higher levels of DNA methylation tend to block transcription. And when we think about this in the analysis, it's a little bit like a, a dimmer when we think about it, so that higher levels of DNA methylation are likely, although we're not sure, likely associated with reductions in gene expression. So when we talk about adversity and how adversity could impact epigenetics and DNA methylation, what we're gonna be looking at today is child maltreatment which is particularly concerning when we look at here that as many as 700,000 children in the United States are identified as victims of maltreatment. And if that number is staggering, what I want you to look at is this, which is that as perhaps as few as 5% of maltreatment cases are actually reported. So when we think about the magnitude and the prevalence of maltreatment, it's a serious both public and mental health problem. And what we know is that children who experience maltreatment are at substantially higher risk for the development of psychopathology. Although not the focus of today, they're actually at substantially higher risk for a whole host of negative health outcomes as well. What we also know is that children who experience maltreatment have been shown to have detrimental effects to their biological stress response system, and in particular, the HPA axis. So when we think about glutocorticoids and that they're regulated through the glutocorticoid receptor, through, through cortisol, and they're important in various systems, metabolic, endocrine, and um, inflammatory systems, and they're also important regulators of stress response in the body overall. And now what we think about is DNA methylation of NR3C1, which is a glucoid receptor gene, is that methylation of this gene could be very important to the biological stress response system and that higher levels of DNA methylation of this NR3C1 gene is often shown to be resulting in reduced expression of this gene. What that means is there are fewer binding sites that result in higher circulating levels of cortisol. And what we can think about this over time is that this is sort of the body's stress response system on overdrive. And what we know is this dysregulation of the HPA axis has been linked to the development of psychopathology and other mental health problems and physical health problems. 
So met DNA methylation and epigenetics focused on stress-related regions like NR3C1, which is the focus of this paper, may be particularly important because then we have direct hypotheses and very strong animal models to show that DNA methylation of these regions have very large implications for both biological and behavioral and social health. What has been shown fairly consistently is that early experiences of maltreatment and other severe adversities has substantial impact on methylation of the glucocorticoid receptor. What we have the strongest evidence, which was Michael Meany's work and others uh, over a decade now, is showing very strong animal models to show causal effects of maltreatment on DNA methylation of this region. It has also been shown in human children and adults that maltreatment has a substantial effect on, mal on DNA methylation. However, when we think about what us as social and behavioral science researchers can bring to this is that this research has been exclusively cross-sectional. And that prior to this study, there had been no examination of longitudinal change in DNA methylation over time in this region. There have been a few studies that have been done, one by Caspi and others, um, looking at sort of broad spans across the methylome, but no specific focus. So we're talking about a handful of studies that looked at this longitudinally. And what we really want to do is what we have in this study is identifying an at-risk sample that within the last six months has experienced maltreatment that's been documented, and then understand the both immediate, short-term, and long-term biological impacts on DNA methylation. And that's really the focus of this study, which is does child maltreatment contribute to change in DNA methylation of this region? So what we're going to be talking about is what I like to call shortitudinal designs, because we're talking <laughs> We're trying longitudinal, but short. <laughs> uh, so it's six months. What I want to highlight is that, one, detecting change in six months in a, non, in a sample that is not clinical yet, that is at risk, is hard. So when we find it, it have, could have huge implications. And when we detect change over the short term, it could have very large implications for cascading effects over time throughout development. We're also gonna be focusing on the preschool and early childhood period. So we know that this is a, an, an incredibly important time for brain, behavioral, social development, so that impacts both biologically and behaviorally at this stage could have drastic effects across the lifespan. So I really wanna talk about this sample here, and that this is a sample recruited through in Rhode Island. So last year I was on clinical internship at Brown, uh, which is great, by the way. Um, and that this is a sample of 260 preschoolers, and half of which, or a little over half, half of those, have child welfare documented moderate to severe maltreatment, predominantly physical abuse and neglect that happened, that was documented in the last six months. Now, we like to think this is an assessment of DNA methylation that is fairly close to that exposure. However, as we know, and anyone who's been involved clinically in the system, is that perhaps this exposure happened further back. Uh, and in future, when we're following up this sample, we can really understand and try and get closer and closer, as well as understand the different types, severities, or multiple events of maltreatment and how that could impact things. What's also important is that what is our control sample in this example is children who are demographically similar, who are also at very high risk. So we're not, we're gonna be doing comparisons between maltreatment and controlled children in this study, and the controlled children who are overwhelmingly living in poverty in Rhode Island, where there's actually a fair amount of violence in inner cities of um, Rhode Island, so they have a high amount of adversity. And we're gonna be looking at the impact of maltreatment over and above other experiences of adversity related to poverty and contextual stressors. So our measures, we use the child welfare documentation for coding of moderate to severe maltreatment status. Um, and we get, we're categorizing there between documented maltreatment and then no previous history of documented maltreatment. We're also assessing DNA methylation of two key exons of NR3C1, and that's measured via saliva samples and using a pyrosequencing method. As I'll talk about in the limitations is that saliva is one very accessible method of, of assessing DNA methylation. 
However, we think about DNA methylation is that there is tissue specificity. And we don't yet understand for sure is how much of this DNA methylation we're assessing could be noise or not. But we do know is from a fair amount of studies is that one, DNA methylation assessed assess through saliva is highly correlated with both blood and brain. Um, and there are some studies that suggest that it actually may be the most highly correlated with brain over blood. So but there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. But that is a potential limitation. And that with very young children, obtaining blood samples is very difficult. Um, we're following the sample up in middle childhood, but still we get not as many who are willing to give that blood. And as we know, that's probably not a random um, assignment to not having blood. So we might end up biasing our samples. So saliva may be our best chance here. We're assessing methylation at what I'm calling baseline, which is within six months of this documented maltreatment, and then a six month follow up. So we can think about this as initially after the maltreatment, and then DNA methylation and stress exposure within the year following that documentation. So there's a lot of things that can contribute noise, and that one, these are DCF involved children, so they're going to be getting some services here, and I'll talk about that. However, um, none of the services are coordinated by us, and there's a lot of variability in what families are receiving here. We also, which I'm not going to talk about very much, is that in all of our analyses, we use principal components um, from the psych array to account for any DNA-based ancestry. So hopefully we're accounting for any um, population stratification or sort of core genetics. We don't account for any SNPs on NF3C1 because we didn't find any differential associations there, but we have another paper on FKBP5 where we do need to account for genotype because there are differences there, which I think is actually quite interesting. So I broke it all down into like a single picture here that summarizes a lot of analyses. So this is gonna be summarizing um, analyses across most of Exxon 1 and several CPG sites of Exxon um, 1F. And what we find here, confusing, two different pointers I gotta work here. What I got here is, what I want you to focus on is this baseline difference. So what we see is children who are maltreated at baseline show higher levels of DNA methylation, which replicates previous findings, not only with a subsample here, but across several different labs. What is really interesting is that what we see is a significant slope. Uh, side note here is all analyses here are using latent change score analyses, so we have both between and within person differences modeled, and we're able to examine within person change tra trajectories across just two time periods, very similar to a latent growth curve model. So what we have here is that maltreated children have a significant decrease in DNA methylation over just this six months which I think is really exciting, confusing, interesting, a lot of things. Um, what we also see, which is also very confusing, is that they're still, the groups are different at follow-up, but now it's reversed. So what I, I'm gonna talk a lot about that reverse here, but this is all in comparison to these still demographically matched and at-risk comparison children, but their DNA methylation levels remain almost identical across this six months. And again, this is accounting for other adversity and potential population stratification. So what we see here is that children who experience maltreatment have an initial changes in DNA methylation and that they have substantial changes and variability in that change over time. And then they have significantly lower levels of DNA methylation at the six month follow up. I'm gonna talk a lot about that though. The thing to really point out here is that first, this is the first study to examine this and we're hoping others and this stuff starting to come out now who are also examining this in other data sets. But what is really interesting here is that since we have DNA methylation, which is thought to be fairly stable in early childhood that is showing fairly large differences within just six months without any major intervention. So what that says to me, one, is that we need longer term follow-ups to really understand this trajectory over time. But two, in early childhood, we may have a huge opportunity for intervention prevention. And that perhaps, and where we're following this up with other RCT designs, is that could we perhaps reverse this effect of biological embedding of adversity? Or could we reduce that impact and then 
create a biological foundation for healthy development and resilience. So the compl what I want to focus is this picture, and this is all made up data, by the way, it's just my hypothesis, um, is that what we see in this is we have initial stress response. So DNA methylation increases in these children who experience maltreatment, and then what we observed here, what I'm calling this overcompensation. And what I didn't show here is that those changes in DNA methylation are associated with increases in internalizing symptoms in these children across six months as well. So I think what, this is what we see clinically is that children who have very recently experienced adversity are experiencing dysregulation of both of emotional and behavioral dysregulation. And that you see this overcompensation. And the hypothesis, what I'm saying, is suggest that this decline, this continued decrease, would continue throughout development and into adulthood. And that would then be related to more severe psychopathology and PTSD. What supports this is that some of our work and others in early childhood are showing increases in DNA methylation from children who are maltreated, but people who have, are looking with adults with PTSD are finding lower levels of DNA methylation in adulthood. So what I think we may be finding is that a very interesting trajectory of change over time in DNA methylation, and this sample is going to be following up in middle childhood now, so we're being able to see, does that continue to decrease or does it return? An alternative hypothesis, which we'd also like to look at, and we'll be using a, a parent training program with the uh, collaborators at FIU, is that could this overcompensation here actually be the effect of intervention and reductions in experiencing of maltreatment based on DCF involvement? And that could changes in parenting account for reductions? And maybe we found just a smaller spurious differences at this follow-up? So I think there's a lot of exciting research to be done here. There are some important limitations that I wanted to discuss. So we use this power sequencing method, and I think what's important is that next generation sequencing technologies are allow us to have greater and greater specificity with our assessment, and we'll be using those methods in follow-ups. We're also only examining short-term change, so we really need to, like, we need to examine longer-term change over time. I would love, this would cost a lot of money, but and I guess let me know, but uh, <laughs> uh, I would love to actually get repeat assessments every six months over time to really get an idea of both short-term and long-term change. So we'll be following up this sample five years later, but we're missing a lot of potentially important information during that time. It's also cell type. So what we're going to be focusing on here is that these analyses are focusing on saliva, but then if we end up using a methylation epic array, which we're hoping to do in the next phase of the study, we could potentially account for potential cell type variation. And what would be very important is be able to connect this changes in DNA methylation to biological um, functional significance and that changes in gene expression. So what you saw there in that graph is actually fairly small quantitatively differences in DNA methylation. So we don't know is how much change in DNA, DNA methylation will change that transcriptional landscape and actually make changes in gene expression. We're following that up now. What makes me encouraged that we are seeing biologically significant differences is that this finding has been replicated across, at least at baseline, across dozens and dozens of studies, multiple labs, animals, and human research. But also we see that these small changes and small differences are significantly associated with both behavioral um, and biological measures like cortisol. We also focused on a single little tiny piece of the methylome and that what we're doing to follow up now is looking at the entire methylome. So across these analyses there are 37 CPG sites that were part of these bundles whereas we're hoping to follow up with 850,000. Now what's difficult about that is the multiple comparisons corrections that we have to account for, but then we can actually get an idea of the vast impact of maltreatment on the methylome and then on behavior. So we're hoping to do these follow-ups and use RCT designs, but we think it's an exciting direction for behavioral and social research. So I acknowledge my mentor for this project, Audrey Turco, when I was at Brown last year, as well as my collaborators. I think this, for me, is an exciting area of research because it is inherently multidisciplinary. And that Beiju Yang is an excellent mentor of mine in bioinformatics, and Carmen Marsett at Emory in epigenetics and public health, and then the group at Brown in both developmental, biological health, 
clinical psychology allows for a team that is able to approach these questions. I'd also like to thank the fa families and then the service providers that helped make this study possible. Um, I have some supplemental materials, questions later, but we can jump over those. Lots of numbers. And let me jump here. Thank you. Tent card lessons before next year. Take it over. Okay. okay. Good. All right. Well, first off, uh, thanks for inviting me here today. Um, it's a, a true honor, and thanks to Dr. Elwood and his team for putting this all together. Um, so, a little bit different type of talk today. So, I'm going to be talking about a recent um, journal neuroscience paper: Are cocaine-seeking habits necessary for the addic uh, development of addiction-like behavior in rats. Um, so I thought what might be good to start off with was just a little bit about where I am right now, because it's a little bit of an interesting institution, the Open University. Um, it is, was established as an experiment in the 1960s in sort of distance education that was open for all. Um, it, a lot of the lectures were given on the BBC late at night, and that collaboration has continued uh, over time. And it's currently a uh, the biggest university in the UK. And while we don't have undergrads on campus, we have graduate students and postdocs in the labs. So it's a really interesting place. OK, so today I'm going to be talking about addiction. The dictionary definition of addiction causes a compulsive need for and use of a habit-forming substance. So what I was wondering was, is this completely accurate today? Is it appropriate? Is it contemporary? So to get at that question, we first want to understand what a drug habit is. So what is habitual behavior in terms of uh, its scientific definition? Um, so there are multiple aspects to it. Same actions repeated over and over again. Automatic behavior, uh, insensitivity to devaluation of the reward, imbalance between goal-directed and preservative behavior, and loss of inhibitory control. Um, and we've gotten into studying a, a, a bunch of these, um, but the two that I'm going to be focusing on today are this same actions repeated over and over again and how automatic behavior is. Um, and I apologize at, at any point in time if I mix up my English and American wording of things uh, throughout the talk. I try to keep it consistent as possible. Okay, so. Um, here's an example I like to share that I experienced one day in Michigan where a lot of this research was done. Um, the liquor stores are called party shops. In this situation, I was around at 7 a.m. The liquor store was supposed to be open, but it wasn't. Um, and there was a line of people standing outside uh, waiting to get in. Um, so what should they do? Well, somebody said the beer depot down the street was open, and they said, let's go. So this line of people moved over to the beer depot to get their alcohol. So you know, using this example, obviously, it's a little bit oversimplistic, but people have to change their behavior to adapt to specific situations in order to obtain drug in this situation, alcohol. Um, so therefore, I'm arguing that the act of drug seeking itself might not be a habit. Drug taking might be a habit. There might be other things going on, like routines and things like that. But seeking out drug, going and finding it, might not be a habit in and of itself. And so the question I wanted to ask was, do rodent models of addiction account for non-habitual drug-seeking behavior? Um, just very briefly, in most studies, rats um, press a lever many times over several hours, sometimes six, eight hours, uh, um, to take a drug. Oftentimes, one lever press equals one infusion. There's lots of different procedures here. But in this type of scenario, the pursuit of drug might become very habitual and automatic. So how do we investigate non-habitual drug-seeking behavior in rats? So it was sort of a two-step process in terms of designing the experiments. Uh, first, we wanted to start with a translational animal model that develops addiction-like behavior in these animals. And we used uh, something called the intermittent access schedule. Um, and so what happens here, and this was modeled after some human studies, is that rats 
take cocaine in a binge-like pattern. Okay, so they get access, free access to cocaine about five minute, for five minute periods. Um, they take as much as they want. Um, and then there's a sort of a, a timeout period of 25 minutes where they sort of don't do anything. Um, and then a lever comes out and they can take drug again. And this repeats over and over and over. So you get these sort of spiking brain cocaine levels over time, and this is thought to be important to the development of addiction. Um, when rats are exposed to this pattern, they develop several addiction-like behaviors, um, including escalation of drug self-administration, enhanced motivation for drug, continued drug use despite negative consequences, and high propensity for relapse, a lot of the DSM-type criteria. Um, and so we took this initial model and we built upon it something called the puzzle schedule. Um, and then we can ask a couple of different questions. Is the development of habitual drug seeking really required for this transition to addiction? And if it's not necessary, what types of brain plasticity might be related to addiction? Uh, I won't go into that second point all that much today. So what is the puzzle schedule? So briefly, rats have to solve different puzzles every day in order to get access to a reward-taking lever. So here is an example puzzle. Here's an example Long Evans rat. It has a tether and a syringe with cocaine. Um, and so what happens here is the puzzle consists of what I call these three manipulanda, this rolled seeking lever, a nose poke hole that the rats can uh, go into rats and rodents like poking their nose into holes. It's very natural behavior for them. And a wheel that clicks, and the rats also love this. Uh, so in this puzzle, what the rats have to do is they have to respond three times on this rolled seeking lever and then spin this wheel twice. So the rat does that, presses that three times. It gets a positive feedback signal, a beep. Um, then it goes and does, does something else. In this situation, it goes to the nose poco, but that was the wrong response. So it has to restart the puzzle. So this is very challenging for the rats. So it goes back to the original lever, presses it three times, gets that positive feedback. It knows it has to go do something else now. Goes and turns the wheel twice, gets a beep. And then on the other side of the chamber, a lever appears where the rat can sort of binge on cocaine for about five minutes. And actually, it's a very interesting pattern of cocaine taking that the rat does, but I'm not going to get into that today. And the other important thing here is every lever press and cocaine infusion is accompanied by a cue light. Um, we'll get into this later, but uh, this is, it's important to note that you know cues associated with drug taking are very influential in, in, in instigating reinstatement and relapse of, of the behavior. Um, then, as I, I said before, there's this timeout period where the puzzle is off, rats don't have access to cocaine, and this is all repeated uh, for 10 trials a day. And so there are lots of different puzzles. This is just the first 20 of them. Um, they change daily. They tend to get more difficult across days. Rats need to change their behavior on a daily basis, and so I suggest that the seeking behavior can't be habitual or automatic. And so we had various tests that I'm not going again to today to also uh, look into this. So what does drug seeking look like across weeks of self-administration? So here are your weeks of self-administration. Um, seeking increases with drug experience. The rats are more motivated to, to seek drug. We normalize this to responses per minute because there's different numbers of uh, responses required on the puzzle. And this is what I call puzzle perseverance. So how many times do they have to restart the puzzle and are they willing to continue working on it? And that increases with time. Um, what about drug taking? Well, drug taking escalates. It increases over the course of weeks of training. And this is another you know, hallmark of addiction. Okay, so I've shown you two indicators of addiction-like activity, increased drug-seeking behavior, escalation of drug self-administration. There are other things that we've looked into, which I'm not going to present data for today. Um, this includes high motivation to take drug with activities focused on procurement. We did some behavioral economic modeling uh, uh, based on this past year's Nobel Prize, essentially. Rats, seeing how much the rats are willing to pay in order to get cocaine. Um, we looked at difficulty stopping drug fish suits, continued search for drug when it wasn't available, continued substance use despite harmful consequences. 
So were the rats effectively willing to shock themselves in order to get drug um, and high propensity for relapse? So a cue that is predictive of drug instigates reinstatement of drug pursuit. Um, and so we, we saw increases in all of these, and I think an important thing to note here, which I'll again note in the next slide, is that there was a lot of individual variation in, in, in these behaviors, and that, that's sort of reminiscent of the human condition. Not everyone who tries a drug will become addicted to it, so we stress that in the paper. So briefly using a procedure designed to prevent habitual drug seeking, we still saw motivated self-administration and the development of what we call addiction-like behavior. Um, very briefly, I'm running a little low on time, but what, what um, types of brain neuroplasticity um, are underlying this drug seeking? And so we've been looking at this. We've been focusing specifically so far on the dopamine system. We've done some pharmacology as well as um, uh, fast scan cyclical tammetry, and I'm hoping to do some fiber photometry. We've been looking at presynaptic plasticity. Um, specifically, I'm interested in dopamine transporters, mainly because there are various polymorphisms in that uh, 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 gene, um, which might suggest individual differences in addiction propensity. Uh, postsynaptic plasticity, um, and what I call neuronal ensemble encoding of behavior. So are specific neurons responsible for motivated or conditioned responding? Um, and again, we're interested in individual variation. To help us do this, we're looking at some transgenic rat mouse mm. models. And to end the talk today, I just want to focus, say that I, I'm interested in sort of looking at whether, um, you know, habit formation in drug seeking exists in people. Um, and to go beyond that, I have some other experiments where I am actually looking at, at people and individual variation. Um, and in particular, what I'm looking at is high propensity for relapse. How cues are, that are predictive of reward um, might instigate sort of reward pursuit. So I'm not looking at this um, in terms of drug abuse as of yet, but I'm looking at it in terms of other things, which I can discuss. I'm hoping this works. Yes. Okay, so what you can see is you have a room here. This is based on some other experiments that I've done in the lab. Um, sorry, it's a little choppy. But um, right here, you have a cue light on the wall. Um, so in this situation, the individual is going to this cue light. Um, maybe it's attracted to the cue light. Maybe it finds this cue light motivational. But the important thing is that cue light will always predict uh, some sort of reward. So in this situation, this reward is a gambling token. And this repeats over and over again. And what we can see, what we've seen in rats, is that there is individual variation in this type of behavior. Some rats are really motivated by that cue light, and they become attracted to it. Um, it draws their attention. That involves the dopamine system and the cholinergic system, whereas other rats completely ignore this light, and they are only focused on, on the, the location of reward delivery. And this might have implications for you know, drug abuse and other um, sorts of behaviors as well. Um, what we can do is we can collect data in terms of where people are in space, um, what they approach, where they go, um, and what they're looking at at any given point in time. And we can look at you know the influence of reward, predictive stimuli on different behaviors. So food cues, gambling cues, drug cues. Um, I mentioned to some people earlier today, we're sort of doing this actually right now. Um, in populations of individuals who have type 2 diabetes or celiac disease and see how uh, uh, food cues sort of influence their behavior and motivational state and uh, um, affective state. Um, and I guess last thing, being, being an online university, I've sort of adapted this to teaching individuals, students about Pavlovian conditioning. So the students um, play this game or they will play this one. We haven't rolled it out to them yet. Um, they collect the data, they analyze it, uh, um, and they, they, they learn about motivation and conditioning that way. And with that, I just wanted to thank um, the, the Terry Robinson and uh, Monica, who were uh, primarily um, very influential in this work they presented today. 
a lot of the funding came from the National Institute of Drug Abuse, and thank you again for inviting me here. It would seem to me that what your research is suggesting is that making drugs harder to get doesn't decrease drug use, which is depressing to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that could potentially be one implication. Yeah. Is this on? I don't think so. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Okay. I'd, love, I've, I'd love, this is something I'd love to, you know, um, talk with people about. It's something that I've sorry, thought a lot about, uh, especially in terms of some uh, countries and some institutions that have like safe injection sites, for example, or that even provide, you know, clean heroin, clean drugs, things like that. Um, does, if the rats, for example, are really enjoying, you know, the, this, this, the challenge of seeking, if you take that away, will they be less motivated uh, to get that. So if, if a person has to, do, does an individual, a person, somehow enjoy the act of seeking out the drug, maybe consciously or unconsciously, and if you take away that component by providing a safe site, how will that influence motivation to seek and take drug? Make sense? Yeah. yeah. One of the qualities that I... Great presentation. One of the qualities that had to fall by the wayside for your 15 minutes here is, is in your comparison of rat behavior to, uh, um, to professional human drug use procurement behavior. And in your, I, what I also got out of your paper is, is yes, there is a reason uh, um, to share in Erica Spotts' depression, but uh, also there is a likelihood that uh, um, for, for some rats and potentially some humans, the difficulties associated with procurement also can preclude addiction. Did I misread your paper or is, is there also, okay. Yeah, yeah, so. Just to follow up to that, I was wondering if um, during your experiment or if you're thinking about making it more difficult or more complicated over time and if you know, there are different groups of um, ones that are more attracted to the drug seeding as it gets more complicated and ones that aren't. Um, and then I had another question in, in terms of the methylome. Um, so for the other speaker, on wh what do you see the next five, ten years being the most important questions or um, for behavioral scientists for that? Okay. Um, so, uh, to an answer your question, so yes, there is individual variation. Um, so how we divided the rats were sort of according to DSM type criteria that they met in a, in, in, in a sense. And so we had, uh, I think, three or four different criteria and rats that met a certain number of them seemed to be more motivated to seek uh, the drug than, than the rats that did not meet those criteria. And so it was, it was roughly about, I think, 20% of the rats that seemed to develop that sort of um, aberrant motivation for the drug, um, whereas 80% did not. And so that, that actually, actually seems to be relatively reflective of the human literature as well. Okay, and then I think your question was about like five to 10 years, where do you see the epigenetics research going? Is that right? So I'll actually speak to where I see like the social and behavioral epigenetic research going. So what I do is I very regularly, I now follow a lot of people on Twitter and I, I follow a lot of the hard sciences publications and outlets to see where are they going with it because we're always going to be a little bit behind the bench scientist on these things. But I think in the next five years you're going to see more people publishing longitudinal change in DNA methylation and that a lot of these people have samples and they're being um, examined. I'll also be curious to see if the field more strongly moves away from hypothesis-driven, candidate-focused approaches and to focus exclusively on exploratory, discovery-based, methylene-wide approaches. Uh, I think there's strengths to both approaches, but I, I could see it moving away from candidate approaches. Um, 
And then lastly, I, I would like to see, and I think we'll see this within 10 years, more and more focus on changes from interventions um, and then maybe trying to understand from a personalized medicine approach how we could use this information to identify risk, but then also how to integrate it into treatment and intervention approaches. There we go. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, Dr. Moran, thank you for the very nice talk on resilience. Um, I had a question about, um, so the fact, so many of these studies, they look at sort of one outcome, often depression or some other mental health outcome, PTSD, but data sets like HRS and others have a wide array of outcomes on which people may show different trajectories. And one of the conversations in the resilience field is also whether it's the presence or absence of the negative, like depression, that determines whether someone is resilient versus the presence or absence of something positive. So um, what is it that accounts for people doing well on one of the sort of more adaptive trajectories? Could it be the presence of some more positive characteristics, well-being, changing over time, meaning-making in the context of illness? Do, have you looked at anything like that, uh, or do you have any perspectives on how one might go about uh, taking a sort of more multi-outcome perspective to really clarify who's resilient and why? Yeah, uh, there was actually some really nice preliminary research presented at APS last weekend by George Bonanno's group, but they were looking at cognition and disability in addition to depression as sort of a multimodal outcome and still finding that the, the outcomes in the resilient group were sort of best across multiple measures. But I agree, I think that it's likely the confluence of positive factors, not just the absence of negative ones, and that's something I'd be really interested in. We've got so social support measures and HRS, sort of measures of how often you have interaction with family members and friends. And, and other um, sort of interest level things, altruism, volunteering, things that you might see increasing well-being. So that's something that I'm certainly very interested in as well. And I've done some of this work um, in sort of looking at trajectories of cognition as well. So I think there are a lot of opportunities to look at outcomes other than depression. If I could just take the opportunity to advertise the fact that the HRS now has a well-being module that's been added. So. Both, I mean, there are a number of measures of well-being in the psychosocial survey, including, you know, purpose and meaning and life satisfaction, but there's also a time use associated measure of experienced well-being that's been done at least twice now, I think, that could potentially be also modeled in these analyses. Fabulous. I would love to hear more about that. Thank you. And, and that is you. Thank you. In, in your paper, you point out that the uh, um, the the cohort uh, um, that does the best in this sample is uh, older males without a high school diploma or no more than a high school diploma, if I remember that correctly. And and given what you just said, uh, um, thinking about perhaps a stereotype, which would be based in reality, of people who uh, um, perhaps never leave their hometowns uh, um, and so, therefore, perhaps have stronger, stronger social ties. And, um, many of the qualities you were just mentioning. Do you think, or have you seen those those kinds of trends in the cohort of that particular group? Yeah. So that's a that's a great question. I don't actually know the answer to it. It could also be a more sinister possibility, which is that might be a group that's least likely to deport, report depressive symptoms based on stigma. Um, or there could be other issues at play. There could be a cohort effect. Many likely of these individuals are members of the greatest generation, for example, that there might be a sort of different philosophy which would preclude the reporting of these types of symptoms. But I think it's likely that a lot of those factors contribute. And certainly in clinic, and for those of us who are in clinic, we see people certainly at the VA with all sorts of terrible health problems and psychiatric problems who are incredibly resilient, you know, sort of survived into old age, which is certainly a survival bias, but um, who are doing quite well even under the burden of a lot of functional impairments and, and problems. And, and the reasons why they're doing well are of interest to me, even in light of all of these concerns. Great, thank you. <laughs> Not off to a good start. <laughs> I have a question for uh, Diego Monita. Um, I thought it was, I, I really liked your talk. I, I love the, 
systematic work at, at investigating and demonstrating all of the different ways to compensate for the fact that we don't have randomized trials and all the different ways to approach causal inference in an observational study. So that was really great to see all of those methods pitted against each other and, and compared against each other. And it, in fact, that's important for us because it's the case that most of the exposures that we want to study in behavioral and social science, the really important ones, we can't do randomized control trials. We can't expose people to stressful life events and give them heart attacks and see what happens. We can't, um, we can't maltreat and abuse a bunch of children and see what happens. We can't give some teenagers some drugs and see what happens. I mean, we just can't do that. Um, so, uh, so your work, I think, was really important. But I get to the end of it, and you said that we, we see the same outcome regardless of which approach we use. So would you advise us to use the cheap and easy one, just the regression model, or should, well, we, be, so, should we be going to this effort to do all of these additional design yeah. features and, th th and statistical a, approaches? Th th that's a great question because so nowadays, you know, like statistical packages make all these methods way easier than, you know, like it, it, they were initially. So, like for example, like like the two studies that you know, like you guys presented, you know, like like there are many limitations in terms of you know, like the potential confounders of the studies, right? Like like I'm not sure you know, like what how the uh, HSR data set looks like, uh, but you know, like there could be you know, like that depression is associated with I don't know, like symptoms after the illness that that was diagnosed, maybe. Uh, and maybe that's also having an impact on survival afterwards. So that association between depression or, or the resiliency type is confounded by, by the residual symptoms that the survey wasn't able to capture. Uh, so in the example that I showed, all the es effect estimates were the same, but they could be different. Uh, and, and what those methods uh, allow is to think of the exposure, like for example, in, the, in, in your study of the, the, the four classes of uh, trajectories, uh, think of them as different conditions. And you know, by estimating either the, the, the propensity score or by weighting them by, by those probabilities, you remove not just the confounding that's measured, but also the unmeasured, as in a, a randomized trial. So I would for sure advise to, to use those methods because it's, uh, uh, the inferences are way stronger because of that. Not only adjusting for what we know, it confounds an association, but also what we, we, we don't know or what we cannot measure. So yeah, and, and so they, they sound very sophisticated, but once you learn to use them, they're not that hard. It's just a two-step process. You just develop a regression model where you estimate the probability of being in that. So you have you know, like the four classes, you estimate the probability of being in those four classes. And with that probability, then you put that into, in, into the, the, the model, and that's it. So, so it's, it's not that hard. For you. <laughs> Thanks, this is really interesting. Um, so two questions, one for Diego. Uh, it's the old cause and effect question, right? So you're looking at sort of dysfunctional families and the relationship with ADHD. And it made me wonder, so to what extent does having an ADHD child make the family dysfunctional, right? And I mean, because that's one of the questions you're trying to get at. So I was wondering, I didn't quite get how the methods you're using can really sort out that cause and effect. And then um, for Ruth, I was really surprised that um, the type of disease doesn't matter in terms of um, the depression and was wondering if you had any thoughts about why. It just seemed to me that there are certain kinds of illness that one may be diagnosed with that would just seem to have greater consequences in terms of depression. Thanks. Yeah, so, so going back to that question, that, that's a, na uh, a natural limitation of using a cross-sectional data set, and, and we just can't tease that out. Uh, e even using these uh, more nuanced uh, statistical methods, that, that's just a limitation of the use of cross-sectional data. So, so, so for that example, you know, I, I, you're, you're totally right. You know, like I, I cannot say that you know, like 
uh, worse uh, family functioning is related to uh, greater HDHD or the opposite, right? Um, so so that, that's a problem with, with the nature of the data set. However, these methods applied to longitudinal uh, studies uh, Im improve uh, the, the, the inferences. I, I just wanted to exemplify because that, that's the most common type of observational data gathered. I was also surprised uh, by that. My, I think there are probably a few things going on. One is that I think if there were a higher proportion of cancer in the sample, we would have seen an effect there. That would be my guess. There's a lot of literature on, on depression after a cancer diagnosis. It was only 6% of the sample that had a new onset without any of these other disorders. So I think that's probably part of it. And, and also um, that, uh, well, I was going to say something else that is now escaping me. Um, Maybe it'll come back to me. Yeah, <laughs> that if we if we had more data about specific uh, specific health events, that I would be interested in, in in learning more about that. I was surprised to see it. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Stephanie George from the Office of Disease Prevention. I have a question for Diego. So I really also enjoyed, like um, like John had said, I really enjoyed the presentation looking at all the different types of both study design and analytic methods we might use to kind of optimize our observational data. The ones presented seem to align, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, with the specificity criteria for understanding causal inference and being able to say the specific cause is associated with the specific outcome, which we lean on trying to reduce confounding. So I want to take what you did and ask you to apply it to the situation of natural experiments. So across NIH right now, a lot of institutes and centers and offices are thinking more about how we can better optimize our methods to evaluate natural experiments. And in many of those cases, we're looking at policies and programs and these types of natural experiments with health behaviors that have you know, sufficient cause, but they may not be necessary causes. So we have magnitudes of exposures that may be less than what you might think of for smoking, something like that. So can you talk a bit about the application to natural experiments? Yeah, well, so I'm not going to solve, you know, like uh, that, that huge issue, you know, like with this, you know, like uh, answer, right? So, but I, I think that also one challenge is um, the, the nature of the exposure, right? So I, uh, I just treated it like, like in, in the example as a fixed exposure, right? Where, you know, like all the families randomized to the, the control group uh, increased their family functioning, you know, like in the intervention group. And, and that's, you know, like uh, uh, another assumption of, of, of doing that, that, you know, like that, that and, and that's a limitation. So, so, but what happens in the exposure, there's a continuous exposure, right? You know, like in the natural experiments, you know, like there are some policy, but not everyone is affected because there are different ways of implementing the, uh, the different policies, right? Uh, so there are different, even though there, there is one big exposure, the implementation of that exposure, there's, there's, I imagine that there's quite a range of exposure. So there, there could be differential effects uh, of the different levels of uh, implementation of the different policies or, you know, like the, the, the uh, I don't know, the different interventions that are uh, developed in, in the natural experiments. However, like using these more nuances approaches allow, allow for controlling for, uh, for, for some of that confounding. And uh, they are way better used when uh, there, uh, there's longitudinal data that is collected and they could be used with additional methods of controlling for confounding. So if there are several uh, baseline measures before the policy uh, is implemented, uh, uh, that's, th that, that could add on top of that because it, it all, uh, something that's really important is the estimation of the probability. I, di I didn't talk about that, but the quality of the, uh, the, con the, uh, uh, of the estimation of the propensity of being uh, in, in a certain group uh, is the key. So the, there could be, uh, uh, so you have to do your best to get a real, really good predictive model of that probability. Because that, if, that's pro if that probability is misspecified, then 
you could be using these more nuanced, me uh, nuanced methods, but uh, you're, uh, you're not going to be controlling for all the confounding that, that could be going on. That's a really great question, um, so I don't know. Uh, but I can certainly look at that. Uh, but I think that would be a nice fine-grained analysis, not only look at like type of maltreatment exposure, but also that level of analysis. We, we are trying more and more, especially with the follow-up, to get more detailed records of what sorts of interventions happened. But right now, we have a very basic data at this preschool age. But hopefully, at this middle childhood follow-up, we'll be able to get more information uh, to really know, one, what did happen, but not only to see, do we have enough big, large enough subgroups to look at changes based on what did or didn't happen? But great question. Sorry, I don't have the answer. Yes, Jim? Please. Uh, so you Thank you. Um, Justin, I'm going to do a, a follow-up also. And again, I love the short to doll. And, you know, one thing drives me crazy with some of the uh, 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 methylation and expression studies, lack of time tying. So what you did, I thought, was nice as much as you were able to do it with the maltreatment documentation and actually looking at things. One thing I was wondering, though, is if you were able to get uh, like waking cortisol and being able to look at, you know, what, what their HPA axis reactivity looked like. Because in maltreating children, some are high, stay, some stay high, some are low, stay low with their cortisol levels. And in the type of analysis you're doing, that could have some really interesting implications. So I don't know if you're able to get that kind of baseline information or not. Uh, it's a great question, and we do, actually. So um, what's being followed up now, and I'm not leading that paper is actually is looking at cortisol and changes in cortisol. And then in middle childhood, um, we have a summer camp study, which is quite nice to do. And then we can really, we can even get better, more longitudinal changes in cortisol over time, not only just morning, but throughout the day and then throughout the camp. So that'll be a really nice added piece of this to look at changes in DNA methylation, changes in trajectories and patterns of change in cortisol. So I think it's an exciting area and a good place to move in. But um, right now, I don't have any good information. Hi. So I had a couple of questions, actually. The first two talks I really loved, and I actually thought they played really well off of each other. Um, and what I mean by that is for Dr. Manita, when I was listening to your talk, a lot of the uh, effects that you were talking about are sort of trying to uncover average treatment effects. Um, but one of the real challenges that we have is for a variety of the exposures that we care about for health and the social behavioral sciences, um, there's heterogeneity in terms of how treatments impact outcomes. For example, um, African Americans benefit far less from a college education uh, than white folks do. And so that's really important. So I was thinking about, um, in the context of uh, Dr. Morin's talk, sort of how can we bring um, treatment effect heterogeneity um, into this literature more broadly, given we know that's the world we live in. Um, and then for Dr. Morin, one of the things I was thinking about um, is in terms of the definition of resilience. And I was wondering if you could bring sort of thinking about a potential outcomes framework, which um, Dr. Manita highlighted, into sort of what resilience might mean actually for different groups. And in a way, you know, the you know it's really sort of where would these people have, where would we expect people to be um, versus where they are is sort of another way of thinking about that and sort of the potential potential outcomes for these these classes. I think. I think I think that's a fascinating question in terms of. It's way easier for us to put things in boxes, right, and estimate average treatment effects when, in fact, we know in real life, you know, like the, the treatment effects or you know, like or all, all effects are different, right? Uh, but however. To get an understanding, we gotta you know like summarize uh, some some way. So I, I think that that the first step is we need to start you know like looking at that heterogeneity you know like in the treatment effects and you know like a, start exploring more. Well, what what does 
the confidence intervals mean, right? And you know, like start talking more about those because when I mentioned, you know, like we all they all had different effect estimates. I didn't even talk about the heterogeneity of them, right? Um, so so I, th I think that's something that that definitely we need more in the field. Yeah. I I don't know if I, if I got if if I got to your question. Thank you. Yes, I'm. I'm really excited about this sort of thinking about uh, resilience in multiple ways. I think it's an open question, especially in aging, what we would expect to see, right? I don't think there's any clear idea, or I think maybe there's more of a negative perception of all of these terrible health events, in addition to probably many chronic comorbidities like hypertension and diabetes and things that we didn't measure because we wanted to measure these sort of more discrete onset events. Um, and, and back to your question, I might expect that cancer would increase depression, but maybe there is a bolstering of social support in that time and more interaction with medical providers in a way that sort of improves outcomes in a way that I wouldn't expect it to just in thinking about it theoretically. So I think that there are a lot of opportunities to think about what resilience might look like because certainly in later life, it's not going to be the absence of any problems. It might just be how one sort of manages those problems in an effective way in one's context um, that we don't really understand yet. And, and certainly that heterogeneity is really exciting. We want to think about sort of future personalized medicine. I think you know, there's a lot of great medical record data. You can look at natural language processing across treatment to look at the kind of language that somebody's using or how someone's interacting with a provider before they drop out of treatment or what we're using as a treatment outcome. And certainly heterogeneity in diagnoses is something um, that's a concern. I think the, the sort of viability of something like RDOC to think about outcomes that aren't just symptom-based would be really helpful and more well-being based, for example, more values based. Terrific. Thank you, Ruth. I know you have more questions, um, but we will need to save them for either the break or over lunch because we do have this room until 1.30. First, though, we'll take a brief break. Welcome back, everybody. I think if you could take your seat, we're going to get started for the, the next half. Mike Spittle. <laughs> He's a colleague. I feel like I can do that. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Erica Spots at, of OBSSR, and I am also the chair of the Matilda White Riley Distinguished, Distinguished Lecture Selection Committee. That does not roll off the tongue. So welcome to the 11th Matilda White Riley Distinguished Lecture. I wanted to give you a little bit of background about what we look for in a lecturer. The recipient of this award has a research career that has advanced behavioral and social scientific knowledge in areas within NIH's, NIH's mission. The recipient's research also follows Dr. White Riley's vision through an expanded conceptualization of health and well being that, com excuse me, <coughs> that includes effective cognitive, affective, and social functioning and quality of life, behavioral and social sciences research results that improve the lives of people in society, illuminating the complex and dynamic interplay among processes at multiple levels, such as interactions between genes and the built natural and social environment, influence of social and behavioral factors on physical health and the utility of this knowledge for clinical practice and health policy, life course perspectives on development, health, and well-being of individuals and societies, and finally, I'm just going to leave that there, research and approaches that build theory and methods in the advancement of knowledge on health and well-being, and I think that we will all agree that this year's recipient certainly fits within all those categories. The NIH community nominates researchers for this award, and the recipient is then selected by a committee that I now need to thank. Um, this year's committee was composed of Anita Bechtolt, Rebecca Campo, Rebecca Clark, Amelia Carricker, Bill Klein, and Lisa Onken. If we could just take a second to thank them for their time and effort. The committee members volunteer their time and effort by reading all of the nominations and then selecting one from among many deserving nominees. <clears throat> now on to our lecturer. Although I think she probably needs little introduction, it is now with great pleasure that I am able to introduce to you this year's Matilda White Riley lecturer, Dr. Terry Moffitt. She is the Nanerol O. Cohane probably still didn't pronounce that correctly, University Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Duke University. She is also a professor of social behavior and development at the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College in London, and the associate director of the Dunedin Multipl 
multidisciplinary health and development research unit in Dunedin, New Zealand. Rather than take up precious time, I will let you peruse her website to look at her numerous awards and even more numerous publications. I think it will suffice to say that her work has changed the face of criminology, neurodevelopment, developmental psychopathology, and probably more areas than I um, am even aware of. Without further ado, I'll ask Dr. Moffat to come to the podium to receive her award and to present her talk. We actually have a, an award this year. Oh, that's really an award. It is. <laughs> <laughs> like an enormous diamond. <laughs> Let me, um, and now I think if I just do that. There we go. Okay. Great. Let me put this here. So thank you very much. This is a huge honor for me. I, I read Matilda White Riley's papers for my qualifying exams in graduate school. Uh, so when I heard from Bill about this award, I, w I was deeply touched. Um, I have three points of emphasis for this presentation that I want to make today. Uh, child to adult life course, multidisciplinary research, and prevention, studies to inform prevention. So if you, if you keep uh, those three words in mind. Let's see, oh, oh, this is not working now. So, this one? Mm -hmm. Ah, great, thank you. So I just keep doing that. So as Erica just described to you, uh, Dr. Matilda White Riley's vision, uh, and I, when I was trying to find the connections between my work and, and her vision to see why I might have been uh, nominated for this award, uh, I did notice that she also was interested in behavioral and social research that is, uh, expands conceptualization of health across multiple different disciplines. So we'll emphasize the multidisciplinary and taking a life course perspective as well. So first, before I tell you about any specific findings, I want to just explain the sort of bird's eye view. Uh, the motivation for my team's overall program of research is to help today's children be better prepared for the rest of their lives. And I, I know this sounds kind of schmaltzy and sentimental, but it's actually just really good demography. So our work is guided by these three demographic facts. Uh, first, because of the falling birth rates worldwide, nations are having fewer and fewer children. And that means that children are becoming increasingly more and more valuable to society. Second, uh, because of the aging of the population and the increasing longevity, there are going to be more and more old people tomorrow. Uh, and this convergence of fewer children and more old people is leading to shifts in what economists would call the support ratio. Uh, that is, there are going to be more old people who must be supported by fewer young workers and taxpayers. So I'll come back to this idea of the support ratio in a minute. But the last demographic point is that people are living longer. Uh, we are going to live, everyone in this room is going to live an awfully long time. So today's children must be ready to support us. Uh, plus, <laughs> we hope, plus today's children are going to be living long lives themselves. And so we must ensure that they are prepared for their own long lives. So let me illustrate what I mean by the support ratio. These are the well-known population pyramids. I'm sure you're familiar with them. They provide a graphical illustration of the age distribution of the population. Blues for males, pink for females. Each horizontal bar shows you the population of different age groups. Babies down at the bottom, workers in the middle, old people up at the top. And I'm showing you Brazil simply because it makes such a pretty example of how things change. In the year 2000, on the left, most Brazilians were young children. In 2020, we see them moving up the pyramid to become workers and taxpayers. And by 2050, they will become old people. And what you see there is there will be relatively few workers to support them. This is the same population pyramid, but for Western Europe. The United States looks just the same, if anything worse. This shift has already happened. That's what you can see. We're well into the process where every child is more and more valuable to society as a worker 
and a taxpayer. <clears throat> so I think behavioral and social science should help to enhance the development early in the life course because we care about children, but also because really it's in our self-interest. So here's an outline of the lecture today so that you can follow along. First, I'm going to tell you about the Dunedin study, and that is a cohort study where I do about half of my research. It takes place in New Zealand. And then I'll tell you about multidisciplinary findings from this study, and then about some life course findings. And at the very end of the talk, I'll end up talking a little bit about aging uh, because we'll come full circle and make the connection back to Matilda White Riley's uh, interest in, in age integration. I'll, I wanted to pause at first and uh, cover the, the thank you to funders. It's customary to thank your funders at the end of a talk, uh, but I understood that there might be some uh, people here from program, uh, and I thought that you might want to recognize the work that you have funded and supported, and in fact, many of you have given me the ideas uh, that I'll talk about today. The main funders of my team at present are the National Institute of Aging on Aging and NICHD. Um, we have prior funders, the National Institute of Mental Health since 1984, and the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research as well. And at present, we have fellowships for students and postdocs from the National Institute of Environmental Health Science uh, and the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And then you see at the bottom, we have these funding partners from Britain and New Zealand as well. Um, and lest you worry that I... Um, uh, that this represents an awful lot of money. Uh, all of these grants are under 500000 a year, and I do not, <laughs> I do not meet the criterion for a well-funded -fund investigator. <laughs> okay, so now let's travel uh, to New Zealand. I just returned from seven months there uh, where I was working on data collection, and the little photograph shows you that I took a group of Duke students with me so that they could learn how a longitudinal cohort study works. I want to show you a video. It's a nine minute video, but it'll give you a break from hearing me talk. Uh, it'll introduce you to the different kinds of data that we collect in this study. Uh, it's very, and it'll show you that it's very multidisciplinary. Uh, and I want to give you a warning uh, that when we were making this video, I found it really hard to look at the camera. So um, I'm no Meryl Streep. Uh, so I'm going to look a lot like a robot or a deer with their uh, looking at the headlights. Let's see if I can get, get this to go here. Unfamiliar mouse. Right. Hello, I'm Timmy Moffat. And I'm Afshalom Kasti. People often ask us, how does the Dunedin study collect its data? To answer this question, we've prepared a short video to introduce you to the age 45 assessment of the Dunedin study, which is taking place from 2017 to 2019. Specifically, we wanted to take a few minutes to show you how we're taking the Dunedin study in new directions, from a study of child development to a study of aging. Actually, if the truth be told, it's the study members who are taking us in this new direction. The Dunedin study is a longitudinal study of a thousand babies born in Dunedin, New Zealand in 1972-73. The children have been assessed repeatedly since age three, most recently when they were 38 years old, with a retention rate of 95%. They're now 45 years old. We're here in Dunedin collecting new data. We show you this slide of Dunedin because some people think it's a fishing village. Really, it is a city and home to the world's southernmost university, which hosts the study. At each age, we bring back the participants for a full day of data collection. This year, we're happy to do so in a new building, purpose-built for the study. The data collection for a phase takes about two years because we're able to process three study members per day. We want to take you through a data collection day that every study member experiences by following Lily. Now, Lily is not a study participant, but she was born in 1972, which is the same year that the study members were born in, and Lily has agreed to help us document the assessment day for this video. 
Lily arrives at the research unit at 8.10 in the morning. The day begins with discussing informed consent with Lily. The first specimen we collect is urine. From there, Lily goes through a series of assessment sessions, each in a different room run by health professionals. The first session assesses vision. This session includes many tests, including a scan of the optical nerve and a video of the eye's moving lipid layer. We also image the retina because the vasculature of the retina gives us a window onto the vasculature of the brain. In this session, we also take facial photographs to study facial aging. The second session is audiology, with several tests of hearing. One of the tests measures Lily's ability to detect speech and noise, first given to the children when they were 11 years old. We're giving it again because detecting speech and noise becomes increasingly harder with aging. The third session is devoted to neuropsychology. We administer the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scales. We also give a diverse battery of neuropsychological tests. These tests have been repeated across the waves of the study, which is the general strategy that we follow for many of the measures that we will show you today as we seek a balance between repeated measurement and novel measurements. The fourth session addresses musculoskeletal health. We assess walking speed and balance with the gait right. This is a long padded walkway with electronic sensors that measure temporospatial parameters of gait and balance. We assess pain experience and pain pressure threshold. We gather anthropometric data. We get a full body scan. Among other things, this measures bone mineral density. Blood pressure is assessed with an extra measure of postural hypotension. Session 5 is devoted to respiratory health and cardiovascular health. This has been assessed repeatedly since childhood. There are tests of lung function, including a whole body plethysmograph. This is used to measure airway capacity and resistance. Also included in this session is a test of cardiorespiratory fitness, which is measured with an exercise bike. The first half of the day ends and the study members are served lunch and given a much needed half hour break. The afternoon begins with social demographic interviews, which cover finances, work, relationships, lifestyles, and revolve around a life history calendar. Over the years, we've gathered a complete month-to-month -month record of each study member's life. Session 7 involves interviews given by clinicians to assess mental health, substance abuse, and illegal behavior. We also assess reproductive health and sexual behavior using a computer-assisted interview. Because this is after lunch, we intersperse these sessions with tests of physical function to keep blood moving and keep people awake. Here you see a chair stand test. This is much harder than you might think. Here you see physical function tests of grip strength and balance. Session 8 is by far the day's favorite, a dental examination. The dental exam has been repeated since the children were seven years old, but the dental imaging you see today is a new addition. We complete the day with a blood draw. Yes, that is a lot of blood. 
The blood samples feed into our biobank, including genome-wide information and various biomarkers, ranging from standard panels to more esoteric biomarkers. The biobank is important because it allows us to track the physiological integrity of multiple body systems over decades. Study members have had a long and tiring day, but their ordeal is not over. After a good night's sleep, they come back the next day to the scanner for brain imaging. This is a new addition at age 45. In the scanner, we collect structural, functional connectivity as well as clinical data. Even after the face-to-face -face assessments are done and Lily goes home, we continue to collect data about her from government administrative sources about social welfare, crime, and health. Study members also give us consent to check their credit ratings. All of this data collection is supported by a diverse portfolio of funders from multiple countries and multiple disciplines. Data generation and data analysis are carried out by wonderful teams of collaborators based at Duke University, King's College London, and the University of Otago. These new data represent the midlife outcomes of study members tracked for 45 years. They're also the baseline for our future research on aging. We look forward to more interesting work coming out of the study. Thank you for watching our video. Okay, uh, now to give you a feel for the life course part of a longitudinal study, what I'd like to do is introduce you to two of the actual study members. These two happen to be siblings. Um, and here they are at age 38, before the age 45 assessment, at age 32, at age 26, 21, 18, 15, 13, this is, this is when I joined the study, uh, 11, 9, 7, 5, 3, and on the day that they were born and enrolled in the study. So many of the measures in the cohort are the longest running se uh, series in their uh, own discipline. In addition to the neuropsychological testing, here you see uh, photographs of the study members when they were five and seven years old, having their hearing tested, vision tests, dental exams, lung function, and motor skills. And these kinds of data mean that we're able to quantify actual change from childhood to midlife. So now let's talk about some examples of multidisciplinary uh, findings. I'll give you some examples of our projects that have made surprising uh, combinations across disciplines and found something new to inform prevention as a result. So we have combined addictions research, research with dentistry research, cardiovascular health research with credit ratings, and environmental led with social mobility, among others. So I'll tell you about the cannabis uh, smoking and, and periodontal disease. This paper was published in JAMA in 2008, uh, and a follow-up study has been published in 2016 with a larger report on the role of cannabis in midlife health by uh, uh, young researcher Madeline Meyer. The backstory here is that everybody already knows that tobacco smoking causes gum disease and tooth loss, uh, but the mechanism for this uh, effect is apparently involves inflammatory effects on the gums that are stimulated by the actual heat and the smoke itself. So if that's the mechanism, we wonder, wondered, uh, why not cannabis smoke too? So we were able to report that regular cannabis smokers in the cohort also develop periodontal disease by their 30s and tend to start losing their teeth in their 30s even when they're not cigarette smokers. So the prevention implication from this project was, if you're going to use cannabis, find some other way than smoking it. <laughs> and floss. <laughs> and floss. Good one, Bill. Thank you. Uh, the dentist on the team would thank you for that. Okay, what about our credit scores, cardiovascular disease risk, and human capital? And in this case, human capital takes the form of early childhood self-control. 
we found that people who take care of their money also take care of their health. And the backstory on this project was that uh, insurance companies are using credit ratings to price insurance products. They know already that people who die early tend to use their health insurance and their life insurance, um, and so they use credit ratings to predict this. Banks are also using credit ratings to control our access to borrowing capital for getting mortgages and starting businesses, and banks know that um, People who become unwell or who die early don't pay back loans. So this is already acknowledged in the world of actuarial pricing, but uh, all of the data have been proprietary. None of them ever published. We were the first to show this connection between credit scores and cardiovascular disease risk in open science. So why should these two things be related? We found that they were related because credit scores actually quantify the psychological trait of self-control, and self-control when it was measured as young as age three years. Um, and we found that people who grow up with low self-control as a child have difficulty when they reach midlife in uh, managing their finances and in maintaining their cardiovascular fitness. The prevention implication from this project is that early years interventions that enhance self-control might actually have very far-reaching benefits that include better health and better financial well-being right into midlife. And now I'll tell you about childhood blood level, lead levels uh, predicting downward social mobility three decades later. This paper appeared in JAMA in 2017. The first author, Aaron Rubin, is a first year graduate student. Not too many grad students have their first year project published in JAMA, so he's pretty over the moon. Um, Something you may not have thought about is that most people in developed nations with automobiles were exposed to lead at very high levels during a narrow window that began in the late 1950s when lead was added to gasoline and paint and ended in the late 1980s when lead was banned from gasoline and paint. So people who are in their 40s to 60s today, this is my age group, make up a uniquely lead-exposed generation. And we also know that lead has its worst effects on young children, and the Dunedin study members were children during the 1970s and 1980s. Luckily, their blood was tested for lead level at age 11, and this was before I joined the study. But it gave us a great opportunity to ask if lead's effects have dissipated or if lead is still affecting these people uh, decades later. So the effects of lead are really hard to study today in the United States, and this is because lead exposure is almost completely confounded with poverty today. But in New Zealand in the 1980s, high lead levels were equally present in poor children as in children from middle-class homes and children from wealthy homes. And this uh, dis disentanglement of social class with lead exposure is, offers us a huge advantage in making inferences today. I also want you to notice on this slide, in addition to the distribution of lead, uh, blood lead levels across childhood social class in the cohort, the blue dotted line. This is the CDC's cutoff for lead danger today. Uh, five micrograms per deciliter of blood. In 1984, the lead level uh, that was then believed to be dangerous was 25 micrograms per deciliter, uh, which is right up at the top there. So only those four children up at the top were actually referred for treatment on the basis of their lead scores at the time. Now, we compared these Dunedin study members' occupations in their 30s to those occupations held by their parents when their parents were the same age. You see the blood lead levels are shown across the bottom of the slide. Uh, the levels above today's CDC cutoff are further toward the right. And what you see is downward socioeconomic mobility of each individual study member compared to their own parents. The differences were very small, but the trend was what was compelling. We also compared the study members' tested scores on uh, intelligence tests. We had, uh, could compare their WISC IQ at age 11 to their WACE IQ at age 38. And we saw that the most lead-exposed children had lost about three more IQ points by adulthood. Uh, this loss of cognitive ability was, again, very small, quite a small effect, but it did mediate the downward social mobility that we saw, 
the lost IQ points and the lost social class standing happen to the same individuals. The prevention implication here is that childhood-led exposure today may eventually have very long-lasting rever reverberations for social inequalities and health inequalities that continue well into midlife. <clears throat> um, so let's move along to the uh, life course, uh, life course asp aspect of the research. And I'll tell you a little bit more in detail about this project. We call this project a small segment of the adult population brings large economic burden. Now, a few years the, the backstory on this project is that a few years ago, the program staff at the National Institute of Aging, Behavioral and Social Branch, um, especially David Reese and Liz Nielsen, uh, were launching a funding initiative on uh, reversibility, what they called reversibility. And that was the possibility that uh, interventions might reverse the effects of early life adversity on risk for late life uh, accelerated aging and early disease onset. Um, at the time, uh, Dr. Reese and Dr. Nielsen wanted to know, is there an evidence base that would answer this question? Uh, should governments invest more of their budgets in early years interventions uh, science in, the, uh, in early life or not? And at the same time, um, I was getting the same question from the British Economic and Social Research Council staff and also from the Jacobs Foundation in Switzerland and um, the Trigfonden Foundation in Denmark. So everybody was asking me, don't you have data to help us struggle with this question of how much research and development budget should be invested in the early years? Now, I should add that I don't have a dog in this hunt. I have never done intervention research, and I don't really plan on starting it. Um, so I was able to approach this question without much personal investment in the answer. And one of the most articulate champions of investing in early childhood programs who does have a big investment is Nobel laureate economist James Heckman. And this is Professor Heckman's graphical representation of his argument. Uh, the bottom line is in the yellow bar on the left. He proposes that preschool programs that are targeted to the very earliest years of life are projected to have the greatest return on investment. But not everybody is, is persuaded by this argument. There is quite a bit of controversy about whether it's really worth the great cost of a nationwide intervention in childhood, like a universal preschool program. There are those who, like Heckman, who say yes. They believe childhood risk predict adult outcomes with strong effect sizes and that this ma mandates early years intervention policies. Risk factors in childhood strongly determine adult life chances, so they must be addressed through early years interventions. There are other pundits, though, who say no. Childhood risk predict adult outcomes with only weak effects. And this means that even if early years interventions were able to correct all childhood risks, a tall order, these kinds of interventions would ultimately bring very little benefit to society. Now, these experts are cautious because they think a lot of developmental science and a lot of neuroscience has been hijacked to overstate claims about the long-term impact of the early years. This is the camp that cautions about the myth of early experience. The cover of this book is from John Brewer's book of a few years ago, but the controversy about overstated claims has, if anything, grown larger and not diminished. Now, the difficulty here, I think, lies with the nature of the evidence base. Even the best published effect sizes from longitudinal follow-up studies are usually small effect sizes. And we researchers get really excited about small effect sizes just because we think it's truly remarkable that there's any prediction at all over the many decades from childhood to adulthood. So we get a Pearson correlation of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and we claim a miracle in the title of our publications. Now, I've done this many times in my career. You just saw me do it with lead, with social mobility. Um, but policymakers are not very impressed by these small effects. They ask if the early years programs are worth the large cost. They want to see a cost-benefit ratio. They see a Pearson correlation of 0.2, and they think that's not very much attributable risk. Uh, eradicating this risk factor probably won't prevent much disease. 
So the question from the funding agencies compelled us to try to think about the prediction question differently. We looked for another way to test whether childhood is an important time to intervene. And we hit upon this idea, which is taken right out of marketing research, and it's the idea of population segmentation. Now, to model segmentation, we were guided by a discovery that was actually reported over 100 years ago by Vilfredo Pareto. Uh, Pareto was an Italian sociologist, economist, and philosopher, uh, so he was quite a multidisciplinary guy himself, uh, and he identified an interesting principle. It appears that 20% uh, of the actors in any field of human endeavor account for 80% of the results. And Pareto made this initial op observation about wealth. So he observed that 20% of the families in Italy owned 80% of the land in the 1800s. So his observations were rooted in social inequalities even at that time. The Pareto principle is still in uh, frequent use today. You hear that in software programming, 20% of code has 80% of errors. And my very favorite from the editor of Vogue, 20% of women buy 80% of shoes. So <laughs> population segmentation is out there. So we need to do this. We needed outcomes that we could count. And we turned to publications like this one, the National Prevention Strategy, and we asked, what do these people count as evidence that a prevention policy has been effective? Well, they tend to use the kinds of outcomes that are recorded in administrative data held by governments to track what is costing them money. So we obtained these same kinds of data for each member of the Dunedin birth cohort from registers in New Zealand. Um, so we have 1,000 cohort members. They had used over 24,000 social welfare benefits. Uh, they had used over 8,000 bed nights in the National Health Service hospitals, uh, over 66,000 pharmaceutical prescriptions filled, uh, over 6,000 cl insurance claims for injuries were paid out to our study members, over 2,000 convictions in the criminal courts. And then from our own uh, data that we have collected ourselves, uh, we were able to calculate that they have uh, smoked over 5,000 pack years of tobacco. That's 42 million and some odd cigarettes. Um, they are carrying uh, almost 3,000 kilograms of excess weight over the obese, over the obese BMI cutoff of 30, uh, and nearly 3,000 fatherless child years among the cohort members' offspring by now. And what that means is if the cohort member is a mother, she has had children that she is taking care of by herself as a single mother with no biological father in the home. Or if the father, if a cohort member is a father, that the father has left his children with a single mother and he has gone away. So we counted up the years uh, of their children's lives in this condition. Um, so now let's look at the data. Uh, I'm going to begin with the social welfare system just to show you how we, how we did it. Uh, and it's really very simple. Uh, this graph shows you that about 20% of the cohort accounts for 80% of the total payments of uh, social welfare support. So this fits the Pareto principle, principle quite closely. Let me explain the chart. The blue curved line at the top just plots the cumulative distribution of the duration of benefit use in total number of benefit welfare payments. And the purple line at the bottom shows you the cumulative percentage of the 1,000 people in the birth cohort. So we start with that 20% point uh, down at the bottom, and we follow the vertical line to the right and connect upward to the cumulative distribution of benefits, and that's how we calculate that 20% of the cohort accounted for 80% of the total number of welfare checks received. This slide will just show you that um, we didn't find, to my surprise, any remarkable sex differences. We looked at outcome after outcome after outcome, and in general, the Pareto principle applies pretty uh, much the same to men and women. <clears throat> so we did this same cumulative distribution analysis for every one of the outcomes that we uh, counted. All the charts are on our website, uh, so you can go there and you can manipulate these data yourself if you would like to. But in a, in a nutshell, I already showed you that 80% of social welfare benefit months were accounted for by 20% of the cohort. 
77% of the nights spent in hospital are accounted for by 20% of the study members. 89% of prescription drug fills were accounted for by 20% of study members. 97% of criminal court convictions, 52% of injury-related insurance claims, 68% of tobacco, years of tobacco smoked, 82% of the fatherless child years, and 98% of the excess kilos of weight over a BMI of 30 were carried by 20% of the cohort. The major limitation of this analysis, shocking as it is, is that so far I've only focused on just one outcome at a time. Um, and that is we sought to identify high-cost welfare recipients, high-cost smokers, high-cost prescription drug users, high-cost criminal offenders, one by one, as, these, as if these were distinct groups in society. Uh, but because we had access to these registers and could merge them for the study members, the data set revealed to us that these costly groups were not independent sets of individuals. The costly individuals in one of these data registers was, were highly likely to reappear as costly individuals in the other data registers as well, and much more likely than statistical chance. This is what makes a population segment. We call these people the high need, high cost segment. Uh, we define them here as people who appeared as costly in three or more of these different health or social service registers. And although this high cost, high need, high cost segment makes up only 22% of the 1972 birth cohort in New Zealand, that's 207 individuals and their data are shown in purple, um, they used up an extreme disproportionate amount of all the resources. They accounted for about half of the kilos of obesity, about half of smoking, and half of the nights in hospital. They accounted for over two-thirds of the social welfare benefits and, and two-thirds of the time spent uh, with ch that children are spending fatherless. They accounted for three-quarters of prescription fills and criminal court convictions. They even made up a third of all the insurance claimants for injuries. This small group of individuals is having a huge footprint on their country's budget. So our next step then um, was to uh, check the prediction from childhood. Remember we wanted to ask the uh, question about um, investing in childhood. So we looked at four risk factors during the first decade of life. Uh, these were measured repeatedly at ages 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11. And they're shown here by colored symbols at the top. The blue diamond is uh, intelligence tested with the Wexler Intelligence Scale for children. The red square was the children's self-control, and that's a composite measure that captures children's ability to regulate their behavior, attention, and emotions. And uh, it was measured using ob staff observations of the children, parent reports, and teacher reports. Uh, the green triangle is the socioeconomic status. This is a measure of each child's family's socioeconomic status during the first decade of the children's lives based on mother's and father's occupations. And the purple circle is childhood maltreatment. And this was based on information about whether uh, the children were treated harshly, disciplined very harshly for that culture and that time, if they experienced multiple changes of primary caregiver, uh, if they were removed from the home by Child Protective Services, or if they were physically or sexually abused. All these measures covered the first decade of life. So how well did these risk factors predict our adult outcomes? If you look on the left, far left side of this slide, you see the left axis is plotted in terms of effect sizes. So point one is conventionally regarded as a small effect, point three as a medium effect, and point five as a large effect size. And across the bottom, you see how the outcome was measured. So over on the left, uh, what you can see is when the outcome was measured as a single outcome, uh, the effect sizes tended to be small. So this is the average effect sizes for predicting the individual outcomes like social welfare payments or pack years of smoking or criminal convictions or hospital bed nights and so forth, one by one as we researchers typically do. And they all gave us small effect sizes. The right-hand column shows you 
the same results of the same risk factors, but predicting this time the high need, high cost population segment that we had discovered, and now we're using that as the outcome variable. So the effect size is increased to large for IQ and self-control and social class and to moderate for maltreatment. Again, I think this is really simple. Uh, you don't have to be very clever to have figured this out. But what it does is it illustrates the big advantage of aggregating on the outcome variable. We in developmental science have typically aggregated risk factors together and counted up forms of childhood adversity, as in, say, the ACEs uh, measure. Uh, but we seldom aggregate on the outcome variable. Uh, and researchers can do that if they're willing to cross disciplines. So you need to be able to do that. So the next thing question is the one you're, many people are eager to ask me, which is how early could we predict this population segment? So, so far I've shown you risk predictors measured across the first decade of life from age 3 to 11, uh, but in many places that policy question concerns intervention at preschool ages. Should taxpayers be supporting universal preschool for three-year-olds? Should governments invest more of their research and development budget in early years research? So to answer this question, we reached back to age three, and that was a time when each child in the Dunedin study was assessed for about 45 minutes during a standard pediatric examination. So as part of this examination, each three-year-old was examined by a pediatric neurologist looking for neurological signs. Uh, their motor development was assessed with the Bailey Motor Skills Test. Their verbal ability was tested with the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. And their receptive language abilities, even if they couldn't talk well or, or didn't have a large expressive vocabulary, their ability to understand adults was assessed using the Raynell uh, receptive language test. And after the visit, each examiner rated each child on their frustration tolerance, their resistance, restlessness, impulsivity, and lack of persistence in reaching goals during the assessment. So we called that the age three poor behavioral control. Now, using these five pieces of information, we were able to create a summary score using confirmatory factor analysis, and we called that brain health at age three. This measure of brain health predicted costly usage of adult social and health services pretty well. Uh, the effect size was 0.6. That's a large effect size. The um, uh, receiver operating curve, area under the curve, uh, was 0.79, and there was a good balance of sensitivity and specificity. So I'll show you these receiver operating curves, what they look like, uh, using age three brain health as the predictor. A rock curve plots the balance between the two kinds of prediction, sensitivity and specificity, and it weighs the true positives versus the false positive predictions. We thought it was really important to consider the false positives, especially in this project, because um, false, positive waste, false positive predictions waste intervention money. So if you label a child as needing an intervention falsely, you can spend a lot of taxpayer dollars delivering the intervention that wasn't needed. But also, worse yet, you can give children a false label, which can be damaging to their lives. So false positive predictions are really risky here and very dangerous, potentially. The statistic of interest from a rock analysis is the area under the curve. The level of chance is the white dotted diagonal line. It represents worthless prediction. The light blue curved line shows you that we really could not do a very good job predicting whether any given child would be a costly user of any single social or health service. So that's just measuring those outcomes one at a time. The orange line uh, shows you that we move to predicting the high need, high cost population segment that uses multiple services. And there our prediction got quite good. So the area under the curve was 79%. That per approaches the 80% level that policymakers look for when they're making decisions. I should pause here and say, too, that when we do these rock curve analysis using maltreatment or IQ or social class or self-control, the uh, area under the curve exceeds 0.9. So really very good prediction of that uh, population segment. 
So if we're given two three-year-old children, one that grew up to belong to multiple costly groups and one who did not, a 45-minute measure of brain health was able to classify the children with, with fair accuracy approximately 80% of the time on outcomes 35 years later. Now, merging our life course data with the New Zealand government's administrative data registers allowed us to do this project. But the cohort is quite small, and it's limited to one birth year. Uh, so we don't really know how far this Pareto principle will extend to helping us understand um, other uh, cohorts uh, or other places. We thought it was vital to find out if the Pareto principle models also apply at the level of nations and across recent history. So what we're doing this month is using the registers for all the adults in New Zealand to test robustness. So the population of New Zealand is about 6 million people. Uh, we're looking at the adults age 22 to 66 uh, and looking at their use of all these different public health services and social services over a period of the last 10 years. Uh, we're able to identify whether the years when they're inside the country as opposed to outside and when they're alive as opposed to dead. So we can have pretty good resolution on when they could have been uh, present, alive, and eligible to use health and social services. We're going to be comparing the age band cohorts, uh, and we compare, can compare males and females with 1.2 million of each. Uh, and uh, uh, in doing this project in New Zealand, we've been able to enlist colleagues in Norway and Denmark who are joining us with their national register data as well. So pretty soon we'll have the answer of how robust uh, this is and how much it changes with historical time and geographical location and form of government. Meanwhile, I'll just summarize the findings from the, the Dunedin cohort. Um, to answer that original question from Liz Nielsen and David Reese, early life risks do seem important enough for adult outcomes to warrant more uh, research and development investment in early years prevention, science, and policy. First, we learned that about one-fifth of people use half or more of multiple different health and social resources. Second, we learned that most people in this population segment share a constellation of risk factors. They have uh, low IQ, low self-control, low social class, and the experience of childhood maltreatment. Third, I've shown you that brain health in the first three years of life is especially important. High need, high cost individuals in this Dunedin cohort did not get an equal chance at success in life compared to the other children in the cohort. They were handicapped by compromised brain health right out of the starting blocks at preschool age. And finally, we've learned that the effect sizes from child to adult prediction have probably been underestimated by looking at one outcome at a time. The last point I want to share with you uh, is about aging. Um, so, uh, in the past 10 years, my team has started working on the topic of prevention in aging and bringing our life course and multidisciplinary approach to that. So, as the Dunedin cohort ages, and as I age myself, I've become much more motivated to think about processes of aging. Um, we notice that the field that's called geroscience is making great progress toward developing treatments drugs, and therapies that might slow aging and might give all of us more years of health at the end of the lifespan. Our thinking about that was that if these treatments or drugs become widely available and they really can slow aging and prevent age-related diseases, probably the best time to take these treatments will be while you're still young. That's before there's damage accrued to your organ systems. So while uh, the, the drugs will probably work and the treatments will work uh, to delay aging, but perhaps not to reverse it. Uh, so we imagined an ounce of prevention in the first half of the life course ought to be worth a pound of cure in old age. But in fact, hardly anything is known about processes of biological aging in people under 60. Most human research in the world of gerontology, geroscience, and aging is defined by subject participants who are over 60 years old. Uh, of interest, in the animal models, they are studying young animals, but in the human research tends to be focused on older research participants. So before this geroscience work reaches stage three clinical trials for treatments to slow the process of aging, 
treatments that will be taken by young to midlife adults, we need to know what the aging processes are for young and midlife adults. So this slide just shows you that we've begun studying biological aging from the 20s through the 30s to the 40s in the Dunedin cohort. And you can see where these recent papers were published. Uh, they're published in American Journal of Epidemiology and PNAS. There's a reason for this. Uh, this is because we're having real difficulty getting our papers into the aging journals. Uh, we got a desk rejection letter from the Journal of Gerontology on grounds that our cohort is not old enough to be eligible for the Journal of Gerontology. So uh, we're struggling along. We're pushing through uh, undaunted, uh, and we decided that what we needed to do was start to try to articulate our argument for prevention-oriented research, and so we're trying to publish papers like this one. Uh, and this just is the Longitudinal Study of Aging in Human Young Adults, knowledge gaps, and a research agenda. So really trying to push that uh, prevention angle. The idea is slowly getting out there. What I'd like to end this talk by showing you some provocative new findings from the first 600 study participants who were already ex assessed in Dunedin at age 45. So these findings are hot off the computer this weekend. Uh, we'll look at... Um, key measures from aging research that can be predicted from age three brain health. Walking speed, retinal blood vessel health, and cognitive processing speed. So walking speed is typically tested in old people to predict mortality, uh, but we gave the gate right test at age 45. And although 45 year olds walk pretty fast and very much faster than 80 year olds, we're finding lots of variation. Uh, the bottom of the slide shows you that the, the measure of brain health at age three. Worse health is on the left. And we're finding that people who had poor scores on age three brain health already walk slower than their age peers by age 45. Now, digital imaging of the blood vessels in the retina is typically performed in older people in order to predict brain diseases such as stroke risk or dementia. Uh, but we gave it at age 45. And again, we found lots of variation. And people who had poor brain health at age three, and again, worse health is on the left, have wider and less healthy venules at age 45 as compared to their age peers. And it's well known that the speed of cognitive processing slows down with increasing age, and that's a good predictor of dementia and mortality. Again, we tested it at age 45, and we found that people who had poor brain health at age three, again, worse health is on the left, have slower processing speed already at age 45 than their age peers. So we think these kinds of findings will push the window of opportunity for prevention of dementia and other age-related diseases back a, a lot younger than age 60. We need to find out what's going on from the earliest years of life. Now, before I go, uh, because we want uh, our research to inform aging science on prevention, we also need to be thinking about the ethical implications of treatments that are intended to slow aging. So we've begun working with the Nuffield Council on Bioethics in the United Kingdom on this question, and we helped them uh, put together this two-page briefing paper for the British Parliament this spring. I really recommend it as two of the most interesting pages you will ever read. So I'll, I'll finish up with this, and thank you very much. So now I think um, if anyone has any questions, we've got some time for questions. I think you have a, yeah. Hi, Terry. Um, great talk. Um, Thank you, Dana. Really fascinating stuff. Uh, the Pareto principle I love. Um, I, when I was in university, I always thought that 10% of the students took 90% of my time, so I think there are a lot of parallels. <laughs> yeah, when you um, get going with the Pareto principle, you can really make hay. <laughs> but um, I was kind of curious. It, maybe I just missed it, but... but um, so one of the protective factors in aging, or against dementia anyway, seems to be social engagement. Mm -hmm. And are you measuring social engagement in your study? A lot seem to be focused on sort of the biology and the cognition, but yeah. is there some measure of social engagement? 
Yeah, uh, that's a great question, and thank you. Uh, in those interviews, which you saw in the in the little video at the beginning, where it, it said, you know, um, the social interviews that are done by a clinician uh, with finances and social uh, social experiences, there's. Uh, quite an extensive interview that's been happening ever since the study members were 15 about their relationships with partners. So domestic violence, but also love, affection, communication styles, that kind of thing. A, a long social support interview, a long interview about uh, who you can rely on for all the different kinds of social support. Um, and we also ask each study member to nominate three people who knows them well, and we send out questionnaires to those people about their impressions of the study members. Um, and so we get the study members' reputations from people who know them well, and that can be used for social network analysis also. It, and then the life history calendars show when they're living with someone, when they're not, when they're getting married, when they're getting divorced. So there's quite a bit of social data. I have to say they're underexploited. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to give this talk here, here today is to advertise that we're really desperate for postdocs and collaborators. So I wanted to advertise the kind of information that we have uh, that, that hopefully people from multiple disciplines will come and, and help us write them up. That'd be great. Yes, Liz. Um, so uh, thinking about the, the false positives and, and a little bit on, along the lines of Dana's question, and, um, and, and just touching back on this issue about interventions and when in life they might be useful. I'm wondering in terms of the people who maybe account for this high risk, high cost group but actually don't incur the cost to society, um, if you have any clues in the data set to who they might be. I mean, with all the connections to social services data, are there sort of like embedded natural experiments in some way within your data set of people who encountered some kind of intervention and despite the, in later life, and despite the fact that they were in that group, didn't show that kind of trajectory. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people, you know, aren't gonna get those preschool early uh, inoculations and we'll have to figure out some way to do something with them when they're in middle age and beyond. Yeah, so the, that, the question there kind of is, is their early years our last chance? <laughs> In fact, one of the things that, that when I give this talk to a group that is more heavily towards psychiatry, I go into some detail about the uh, adolescent, childhood and adolescent mental health status of the people in that high need, high cost uh, segment. And uh, they do tend to present with childhood anxiety disorders, conduct disorder, um, and uh, adolescent depression. So to the extent that they come into contact with mental health services, there's a real opportunity to help them there. Because of their high rate of crime, they're also going to prison. So if prison did a better job of rehabilitation, there would be another chance there, at, at least for the men, not so much the women. Uh, we have looked at, we interview each study member extensively about the kinds of um, interventions and treatments and, and that they have experienced and if they have had psychotherapy and if they have received addictions treatment and it's also in the national health system records that we get from the New Zealand government. So far what we're finding is that the more problems someone has earlier in life, the more of these interventions they do get, but they just keep getting worse and worse. So we don't have any evidence that any of the study members have been significantly helped. We have the study members' opinions, which is that they believe that then when they have become uh, born-again Christians, they have reformed. They believe that when they have got married to a good partner, they have reformed. They believe when they have a baby, they have reformed. They believe, uh, you know, they, they can cite many miraculous things that have happened to them, uh, but it's not in the data. So um, that these are natural interventions. They're a motley type of interventions. We don't know the quality. We don't know how closely the study member adhered. If they were prescribed antidepressants, did they take them? Um, so it, the study's not well designed to look at the quality of intervention. In some ways, I think what we need is something like the NICHD child care, child care quality study, but for older uh, people. That would be really great. Yes. Thanks very much. That, that was uh, uh, fascinating. 
um, and, I, and I will go look this up. Okay, good. <laughs> um, the, I, the, the, there's, you're, you're right, most studies take multiple risk factors but look at one outcome, mm -hmm. and it's, it's really interesting to look at multiple outcomes and one risk factor. But if, if you, can, can you really gas up the area under the curve if you combine brain health at age three with one or two other things? I mean, could, can, you, can you really do a great job of, of finding those 20% if you, if you combine yeah. two of the indicators? Yes, as, I mean, as a general rule of thumb, the more you aggregate, the, the tighter the prediction gets. Is there, is there a small number that really <laughs> Com combining childhood self-control with virtually anything in this data set uh, gives you very, very good prediction. That does seem to be a, but, but low self-control characterizes the children who were maltreated and it tends to characterize the children with poor mental health and it characterizes the children who are failing to learn to read, but it, it seems to be a kind of a unitary mm, risk factor. What's your name, please? The, I know all these folks, but thank you. Hi, Mike Starrett from NIMH. Uh, thank you so much. It's just excellent work. Uh, you mentioned in passing uh, the children of some of the cohort participants, and I'm curious if you have research on or the capacity to look at intergenerational effects, uh, where some of these challenges that you see at an early age that affect individuals as adults mm -hmm. subsequently affect their own children? Uh, we do. Uh, so uh, a, um, uh, let's see, a grant was given maybe 25 years ago to Jay Belsky, who is now at UC Davis, who's one of our collaborators, and he instituted a process of any time a Dunedin study member has a baby that reaches the age of three, we send out a team to do a home visit and they videotape parent-child interactions parenting styles and there's an extensive interview and an assessment of that child. Because young people are waiting until their 30s to have children, we've had a, an unbelievable number of no-cost extensions in order, to, <laughs> <laughs> in order to try, wait and wait and wait for them to have these babies. Now We now have uh, 780 of the study members have had a child and it looks like, for the women anyway, that's all the children they're going to have. So we're starting to write up that data set. Uh, one of the most interesting things that we have from it is um, uh, using our uh, whole genome data for both the parents and the children uh, to look at uh, how the parents' educational attainment polygenic score that's derived from the genome-wide association studies of educational attainment, how that predicts the parents' parenting behavior and how it predicts the child's outcomes. And the interesting thing here, it's not, I think it's not uh, surprising that a parent's polygenic score for better response to the education system would also predict other good things in their lives, but when you control for the child's polygenic score, that means you rule out whatever the child uh, inherited from the parent gene-wise, the effects are still there. So this is really some good concrete evidence that it's what parents are doing. It's the parenting behavior, not just the genetic uh, proclivities that are being passed along through from parent to child. So I'm especially excited about, the, we have I think three papers in review right now um, that are, are looking at the multi-generational study. They've been long in coming though. Thank you. So I think with that, we'll give Dr. Moffitt a final round of applause. I will have some final comments from Dr. Hunter. I have the honor of the closing remarks from Christine Hunter from OBSSR. Um, I was told to move to the closing remarks slide, so I wanted to be sure I did that. I promise I'll be really quick. <laughs> um, uh, I think I just want to say just a few things. First, thank you to all of you, all the speakers. I think this is one of those things where you come to this and you say, boy, it's so great to be a part of the behavioral and social sciences. You get to see the emerging leaders and then just the tremendous work that's been done by, um, by Dr. Moffitt and her team and really seeing, you know, just 
a career's worth of tremendous findings and multidisciplinary work. It's so very impressive. So um, I hope you all agree that this was a wonderful morning. Uh, so in addition to thanking those that came to speak, I want to thank those that planned this, as you might imagine. Uh, it's not an insignificant amount of work to put on a day like this. So to Bill Elwood, Erica Spots, Erica Moore, and all the other people who contributed to making today excellent, thank you very much. And then finally, I just want to say I hope you'll join us in this room for lunch. Some of us ordered lunch, and so those will be outside of the room. But if you didn't order lunch and you want to be a part of networking and talking with the early stage investigators and Dr. Moffitt and the rest of us, please stay for the party. There's a, there's a cafe at the end of the hall. You can pick up some food and, and join us. So thank you, and a big round of applause.